have come to you from the distant past. An era 2,600 years before your own. A time when the four types of noble persons walked upon the earth. Among them, the perfected ones, living in the world, but not of it. Much has changed since our time, but the heart and mind of man have remained the same. Ruled by greed, hatred, and delusion, ties that bind beings to the world. In our time, the Blessed One, the Perfected One, the Rightly Self-Awakened One, arose in the world, and out of sympathy taught us of a way out. He taught us as well of how the way would eventually be lost. This is what the Blessed One said. In the course of the future, there will be those who won't listen when discourses that are words of the Tathagata, profoundly deep in their meaning, transcendent, connected with emptiness, are being recited. They won't lend ear, won't set their hearts on knowing them, won't regard these teachings as worth grasping or mastering. But they will listen when discourses that are inventive works, the works of po poets, elegant in sound, elegant in rhetoric, the work of outsiders, words of disciples, are being recited. They will lend ear and set their hearts on knowing them. They will regard these teachings as worth grasping and mastering. In this way, the disappearance of the discourses that are words of the Tathagata, profoundly deep in their meaning, transcendent, connected with emptiness, will come about. In our time, there were many false teachers, spreading falsehoods, falsely claiming awakening. In your time, these have gone totally unchecked. Gurus, lamas, monks in ochre robes, householders, all may misrepresent and mislead. Just as a fisherman may take a net, glittering with numerous barbed hooks, and place it across the opening of a stream, catching any fish that would pass through that outlet. Even so, these dangerous men and women put forth wrong view that ensnares countless beings. This is our message to you. There are horrors beyond anything you have yet encountered or imagined in this life. And there are those who would, for their own gratification, lure you into harm's way. Don't be deceived. Don't neglect the Noble Eightfold Path. It is the only path that leads one who practices it to the total end of suffering. <laughs>
This is one of your tricks. That was you, wasn't it? Yes. Babalachi got away from me. His heart stopped in the middle of the night. I searched for him all around, in every corner of my domain. The Sangha will, evil one. <laughs> oh, is that so? I've made many improvements there, son of time. You'll see. You'll see. Who are the Sitoedans? Is theirs a true teaching? And are they hiding something? Many students, many seekers, have gone to the Sitoedans, searching for the end of suffering, but have come away severely injured, physically and psychologically damaged, disabled or psychotic. Rather than investigate the causes of these bad outcomes, rather than try to help those who they have led into harm, rather than admit their transgressions and resolve to do better in the future, the Sutoedans have responded when questioned on these matters by ignoring the question, changing the topic, or telling a deliberate lie. We can assure you that such behavior is not consistent with the conduct of the Noble Ones. So how did it come to this? It began with Marvel Logan, a man who would later come to be known as Bante Wimlaramsi. Born in 1946, Bante Wimlaramsi struggled in childhood with learning difficulties and dyslexia. Letters on a page were to him a jumbled mess. In the 1970s, he read a book that sparked in him an interest in meditation. This was Carlos Castaneda's contentious 1968 book, The Teachings of Don Juan. Some reviewers recognized this book as a plagiaristic work of fiction and perpetration of academic fraud, rather than the accurate anthropological account that it purported to be. Bonte Wimleramsi, however, was one of many taken in by Castaneda's deception. Later, at the Theosophical Society in San Francisco, California, he encountered Mahasi Sayadaw's book, Practical Insight Meditation, and began to incorporate that method into his personal practice. Continuing this pursuit, in the early 1980s, Bante Wimaramsi worked as a Reiki energy healer in Hawaii. Around this time, he also published a small book on the subject of methods of alternative healing. In 1986, he ordained as a Buddhist monk in Thailand and spent many years practicing first Vipassana and then the Vasudhi Maga Jhanas. By 1988, his studies had taken him to Burma. While practicing there, 
His teacher instructed him to sit, progressively longer, up to eight hours, motionless, and to deprive himself of sleep. This excessive sitting and sleep deprivation caused the development of blood clots in his legs, resulting in poor health and disability that would haunt him for the rest of his life. By 1995, he had become dissatisfied with the methods that were being taught in his lineage. Another monk suggested that he set aside the commentaries to study the actual teachings of the Blessed One. He began by reading Bhikkhu Bodhi's recently published translations of the Majjhima Nikaya. Due to his learning disabilities, understanding these writings presented an enormous challenge for him. In 2003, he attended a meditation retreat along with fellow student Jeffrey S. Brooks. The teacher of that retreat was Lee Brasington, an American layman and author and former student of Ayakema. Following this encounter, Brooks would change his name to Jananda and go on to form a Sangha of One called the Great Western Vehicle. Later, Jananda and Wimaramsi would meet again in online debate. They never came to an understanding, although their views share much in common. Despite his difficulty understanding the written word, Bhante Wilmaramsi claimed to have penetrated the meaning of the discourses of the Blessed One and to have discovered a secret teaching, a hidden key that everyone else had missed. This having to do with the contraction and relaxation of the envelope surrounding the brain called the meninges, which he believed was something like a muscle. Bhante Wilmaramsi redefined the word craving or thirst as referring to this supposed meningeal tension, and this was the lens through which he would view the discourses. He would go on to elaborate this idea into the method he called TWIM, or Tranquil Wisdom Insight Meditation. Bhante Wilmaramsi's thoughts on the practice seem to have crystallized around this time, as, shortly thereafter, in 2006, he founded his own Sangha and monastery, the Dhammasukha Meditation Center, located in Iron County, Missouri, as well as the American Forest Tradition and the Suthaweda Organization. It was at this time that he gained his first and most loyal disciples, David Johnson, who would become his steward and treasurer, and Sister Kemma, his chief disciple. After surrendering her wealth, Sister Kemma ordained under Bhante Wilmramsi, and using these and other monies, they together built his monastery. She went on to preach Twim throughout the world. In the intervening years, Bhante Wilmramsi made several bold claims about himself and about the Twim practice, including that it was capable of preventing and curing cancer. Many followers gave large sums of money to the group, partly on the basis of these promises. In 2016, Bhante Wilmaramsi acquired his star student, Delson Armstrong. Delson claims to have begun practicing yoga and meditation at the age of 13. Later, he says he trained for extended periods of time in the Himalayas and mastered several systems of yoga, including Pantanjali's Yoga Sutras and Kriya Yoga, mastering all ten yogic samadhis. He embarked on a career as a fantasy writer in 2009, publishing the first book in his Red Serpent Trilogy in 2010, entitled The Falsifier, followed shortly by The Prophet's Secrets and The Elemental King in 2011. Delson boasted at the time that this would be known as one of the greatest books in history. The world at large did not agree. Following this disappointment, Delson was forced to seek more humble employment as a ghostwriter. He found a man who was looking for help writing his autobiography. This was Greg Halpern, an aspiring self-help guru who claims to be from a planet in the Pleiades constellation a martial arts master, vigilante, inventor of miraculous cures, hypnotist, spiritual master, 
and to have had 13 near-death experiences. This quickly turned into something more than a professional relationship. When Delson moved in with Greg and became his protege, living with him in his home in San Diego, California, for six years, studying his esoteric teachings, which he claims were received in a download during one of his many near-death experiences. After apparently graduating from Greg's unique program, in 2016, Delson got involved with TWIM by taking an online retreat led by David Johnson. David, according to the story, treated Delson kindly and was impressed with the rapid progress he reported making. Around the year 2020, the Sutoidans acquired another member, a temporarily ordained person named Liam McClintock, also known as Samanera Karuna or Metananda. He is the creator of the FitMind Meditation app, founded in 2018. He has studied under Bhante Wilmaramsi and undergone teacher training. Liam, in his teaching, has promoted tantric practices such as dream yoga. On November 5th, 2021, Delson appeared on the Guru Viking podcast, where he presented himself as an Arahant, a perfected one, although he carefully avoided saying so straightforwardly. This is in spite of the fact that as a layman, Delson is not subject to any restrictions on such speech. On November 8, 2021, just a few days after the interview with Delson was published, Bhante Wilmaramsi claimed in a Zoom talk that Delson was still only an anagami. To our knowledge, Bhante Wilmaramsi never affirmed Delson's belief that he had attained this great distinction. In December of 2021, on the very day we were scheduled to meet with Bhante Wilmaramsi, he succumbed, just like several of his students had before him, to a state of psychosis, and our meeting would not come to pass. Initially, he was being cared for at DSMC, but when this became too much for his caretakers, David Johnson and Liam McClintock, he was moved, against his wishes, to a full-time care facility. He would remain in this delusional state through to his death in June of 2023. In 2022, Sister Kemma was diagnosed with stage 4 cancer for which she is receiving conventional medical treatment, paid for entirely by the Sutuadans' lay followers. As Bhante Wilmaramsi's chief disciple, someone well-versed and thoroughly experienced in his methods, she would see her own body become a testament to the falsehood of his claims. Since Bhante Wilmaramsi's decline, Delson has taken over as the de facto leader of the group and renewed their efforts to recruit followers and spread their influence throughout the world. What is the doctrine of the Sutuadans, and how does it differ from the teaching of the Noble Ones? We will now examine their claims one by one. Claim Bonte Vimalaramsi is an anagami. It depends on their, their practice, how far they went with it, where they were with it. But it's almost a guarantee, I'd have to say that it is a guarantee, that if you do this practice, and I'm talking about where does it come from, whose is it, if you do that sincerely for a period of time, all of those distractions will stop. They'll all go away. And you will attain some level of awakening. Because I'm a slow learner, it took me about six months. It won't take you that long. You can do it very quickly. <laughs> okay. And you become an anagami, which means a non-returner. You're never going to be reborn in the human state again. You will have no lust or hatred arise in your mind again. You won't have any fear, you won't have any anxiety, you won't have any uh, aversion. Your mindfulness is going to be very, very sharp. 
and what you're going to have in your mind most of the time <coughs> is loving kindness, equanimity, and your mind is going to be very collected. You're not going to have a real active mind anymore. But it'll still be there. There is some still some slight attachment. You start thinking that, yeah, I'm doing pretty good. I, it's still there. And then I'm going to tell you to do more of the same. Go back to the equanimity, watch mind, until the fruition comes. And that's immense. If you're married, um, you're going to be living with your spouse like brother and sister. And that there won't ever be any lust, even for food, arising. You still will have some preferences on food, depending on, because I travel so much, I have so many different kinds of food thrown at me, that I still have preferences of the kind of taste that I, that I want. And that's, that's okay. Not a big deal. Because I, I can eat anything, even bitter gourd. I can eat it, but it just because I didn't grow up with it, I don't particularly like the taste of bitter. I, I grew up with Missouri kind of food. Anyway. I have my own stuff to take care of. And I'm not perfect at it. If I was, I would be an arahat. And I promise you, I am not. Wish I was. But that wish gets in the way of everything. First, we heard Bhante Wilmramsi claim that it only took him six months of practice to attain the first stage of awakening, Sotapanna, or Stream Enterer. Then, he described the third stage of awakening, Anagami, or Non-Returner, culminating in fruition, and related an experience of that state in the first person with reference to his desire for certain foods. Finally, he stated categorically that he is not an Arahant. From this, it is clear that Bhante Wilmaramsi believed himself to be an Anagami with fruition. This was not a well-kept secret. It was common knowledge among his disciples that he believed he had this level of attainment. It is a violation of the discipline for a monk to inform lay people of his supposed attainments or to knowingly misrepresent his attainments to other monks. This is one example of Bhante Wilmaramsi's behavior being inconsistent with his claimed level of attainment. But there is more. Yes, I'll, I'll tell you a story about one student I had. She would sit for an hour. You know, she, she could get into neither perception or non-perception with ease. And she would sit for most of the time. And then at the end of an hour, she would go, well, there's nothing happening. I'm going to get up and go do something. And it drove me crazy for three years. I scolded her over and over again, stop doing that. And finally, she took a retreat with me, and I walked in with a big heavy stick. And I slammed it down in front of her, and I said, I'm going to hit you hard with this if you don't longer. And it scared her enough that she did. And she sat for three hours with ease, and came back and started telling me the praises of sitting longer. I said, it only took you three years to hear what I was saying. And it was, I, I gave her short sentences. But it took her three years to be convinced that along with a big stick. Would an onagami, a person having broken the five lower fetters, free of anger, free of ill will, free of sensual desire, would such a person threaten their own student, someone whose care and safety they have been entrusted with, with physical violence? This is a male teacher wearing a monk's ochre robes, claiming to be awakened, claiming to be an onagami, threatening to beat his female student with a big stick. Would even a decent, upstanding worldling, having no knowledge of the Dhamma and no training in the Dhamma, be seen to behave in such a way? Even if this were only an empty threat, which it doesn't sound like it was, but even if it were, 
an anagami would not make such a threat. Only a mind fettered by ill will would incline towards harming as a way of solving its problems. Oh, I, was, I was with somebody, and I, I, I live in a very small town. I don't live in the town, I live 12 miles from the town. But I was in town and somebody gave me a phone call and they said, we just had a tornado go through the property and they were real excited. And they said, oh, the buildings are blown down and there's all kinds of problems and the trees are, uh, the, all the trees are gone and blown away. And the person I was with that was driving me, she, she said, oh, this is so horrible, this is so terrible. And I'm going, well, let's get there and see. Because people get real excited about something like that that happens. And it can be worse or it can be better, but we'll see. So we got there and yeah, all of the big trees that we had in the front yard are gone. Oh, that's too bad. And the tornado had hit and it took my cabin and it lifted it up and moved it over about six inches and put it back down. And it wasn't on the foundation anymore. So that was kind of a problem. And I had a, a, a roof in front of the cabin and that was gone. Okay, so there's, there's some problems there. We had a, a library and it got blown over and behind it we had a walking uh, swimming pool and it went into the swimming pool and there were a, a number of problems that we had, but it wasn't that big a deal. So I went into my cabin expecting to see everything in my cabin all over the place and I was going to be a major hassle. And the only thing that I found was that I had a bookshelf and it fell. So there was books on the floor. I had a table that was about this size and I had three crystals, big, like this high and about that big around. Two of them were like that. One of them was quite a bit bigger. And they were still sitting on the table beside a glass of water. <laughs> it, <laughs> I mean, it didn't really cause that much problem inside. It's just that it picked up the cabin and moved it over and now we had to lift it back up and put it back on the foundation. So I didn't get excited about it. An anagami has abandoned the five lower fetters. These are self-identification view, uncertainty, clinging to rites and rituals, sensual desire, and ill will. The first three of these are abandoned at the Sotapanna fruition, and the last two at the Anagami fruition. The handling and worship of crystals is encompassed by two of these fetters, clinging to rites and rituals and sensual desire. It is clinging to rites and rituals because, as we'll touch on later, Bhante Wilmaramsi relied on the handling of these crystals in his meditation practice. And it is sensual desire, as gazing upon and handling crystals is stimulation via the sense doors of the eye and the body. It is not possible that a genuine Sotapanna could hold such a view, let alone an Anagami. What's more, crystals are an acquisition. Monks shouldn't be collecting acquisitions. Monks should be practicing for the relinquishing of all acquisitions. Psychic abilities, walking through the, uh, a mountain or diving into the earth and coming out, things like that. I had a student that was very, very good at that. And wherever I happened to be, she'd come and visit. And one day she forgot to take into account the uh, time change. And she called me at two o'clock in the morning. As she came in at two o'clock in the morning, she was in my room. And I told her, don't ever do that again. I don't ever want to see you again. This is wrong practice and I don't want anything to do with it. So that was the last time I saw her. <sighs> I was in Korea and this this lady wasn't following directions very well, and I started scolding her. And she said, I've been meditating for 10 years. I'm in the fourth jhana. And I went, so? You don't know what you're doing. You're practicing one-pointed concentration. You're not developing your insight knowledge at all. And you're slowing down your progress with that pride. Bhante Wilmaramsi described several of these interactions with his female students that seem punctuated by ill will. It's real interesting. Sometimes I'll go into Walmart, where an awful lot of people, there's, they don't like Walmart, and they, they walk around grumpy. But because of, when I first start walking in, I start radiating loving kindness to anybody, I don't care. And then I kind of forget it when I got to go pick this up and pick that up, whatever it happens to be. And I'll see somebody, complete stranger, walk up and start smiling. Oh, you just reminded me. Thank you. So start radiating loving kindness again. 
Loving kindness will help you to change your perspective. It is a violation of the discipline for a monk to handle money. Bhante Wilmaramsi frequently went shopping using the money donated to his Sangha. When questioned about this, he would respond that he used a credit card which is made of plastic and that this didn't count as handling money. Yet again, we see this loophole-seeking behavior characteristic of run-of-the-mill people, following a rule by the letter while violating the spirit. Now, why aren't monks permitted to buy goods, property, livestock, and slaves? Because these are acquisitions or means of acquisition, not of relinquishment. These are ways to waste one's time, proliferate one's responsibilities and obligations. In short, these things are not conducive to the level of practice that monks are supposed to be committed to. Moreover, they are a temptation. With enough money, one can instantly gratify one's base impulses, as it seems Bhante Waramsi did when it came to mangoes, chocolates, tobacco, and other indulgences. The animals, these mills that is a repellent for ticks and fleas, so they don't bother them so much. And we try to keep you on the paths, walking paths, not going into the forest, because that's where the ticks and, tree and, and fleas are. And we give you insect repellent. That's the best we can do. We haven't found another kind of mystical, magical pill that you can take and ticks won't, won't bother you like the animals. That's great. But you're supposed to spend your time mostly sit, sitting anyway, so you'll be in, inside and you won't be troubled by the, the ticks. And we don't allow the animals mm. inside the meditation hall, so they're not gonna, the ticks aren't going to come in. And we have animals around here, wild and tame. But they always bring joy when I see them. And if they're not around for a while, I miss them. Is that an attachment? No, it's, it's just a wish for their happiness. It's compassion for them. Just seeing some butterflies fly around can make me grin and, and laugh. Look at what they're doing. Isn't that great? Distributing pesticides. Longing for the company of absent animals. This behavior simply isn't consistent with the state of an onagami with fruition. But this is still only a small fraction of the evidence available. As we'll see later, misrepresenting the Dhamma and the Buddha is something else that Bhante Wilmaramsi made much of. Claim A twim anagami is the same as a genuine anagami. Naturally, the Sutuadans themselves believe that their attainments are genuine. However, we have seen much evidence to the contrary. Among this is the testimony of former Sutuadans who were assessed as having made these high-level attainments, including the same level of attainment that Bhante Wilmramsi himself professed. In 2015, a seeker by the name of Oleg Pavlov became involved with the Sutuadans. He quickly rose to the level of Twim Anagami. This level of attainment involves the mastery of the state, which the Sutuadans call the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness. The Blessed One did not speak in this way. He spoke only about the state, called the cessation of perception and feeling. Oleg could attain the Twim cessation at will and without difficulty. Bhante Wilmaramsi had confirmed his attainment and attested to it in a ceremony. In 2016, with Bhante Wilmaramsi's blessing and encouragement, Oleg became the head of the Sutueda organization in his home country of Russia. There, he translated and published the twin materials in the Russian language and led many retreats, teaching hundreds of students. This was a fairly lucrative business, and Oleg did not want for money at this time. In 2021, a friend and countryman of Oleg, Pavel Karorgan, had ordained with Bhante Wormamsi in the United States and undertaken intensive twim practice. As a result of this practice, he experienced psychosis. 
David Johnson got rid of the problem by sending him back to Russia in this psychotic condition. When Pavel arrived back in Russia, Oleg found him to be in a completely ruined state, a shell of his former self. After having dedicated many years of his life to the practice, Pavel had come to the conclusion that the Sutuedans were teaching a demonic, evil path. He was able to persuade Oleg to investigate this matter for himself. Oleg, by this time, was already deeply disappointed in Twim, but believed that it was, if not effective, at least fairly harmless. He thought that perhaps there was something wrong with him rather than something wrong with the practice. However, there had been signs. Some of his own students had experienced psychosis as a result of the practice, and, most tellingly, when he honestly investigated the state of his own mind, he found that, although he met the qualifications of a twim onagami, this was not the same as a genuine onagami. After this realization, Pavel and Oleg wrote a lengthy article about the dangers of twim in late 2021 and sent it to David Johnson, Delson Armstrong, and others in the Sutueta organization. The response they received was typical. Their experience and concerns were totally ignored and the Sutuedans would continue to teach these dangerous practices without warning their students of the extreme risks involved. Claim. Bonte Vimalaramsi's grasp of language is correct and his views should be unquestioningly accepted. I'm not truly an intellectual. I play at it sometimes, but my mind is not that sharp. Sometimes you can ask me a question about something and I don't know the answer. And I'll come out and tell you, I don't know. But what happens with my mind is I have a very deep thought, deep thinking. I can think about something in a very deep way and I'll try every angle I can think of to see it. And when I do that, I know everything about it. So you might ask me a question. I might not have the answer for a day or two, but all of a sudden the answer is there. So I'll look you up and say, okay, this is your answer. This is how it works. I don't want to learn Thai. I have dyslexia. I have real problem with languages. I'm lucky to be able to speak English. I have dyslexia. That's why you see me use, use a book marker. Because when I read, words get all screwed up. And I wanted to get rid of the dyslexia as much as I could. Then, then that's why I started reading the suttas to everybody and reading out loud and then explaining a bit about what I thought the Buddha was, was saying. He says it a lot of times and just, I'm so slow. It, it blows my mind sometimes. It takes me a long time to figure things out. But once I figure them out, I have it. I understand it. When I was in school, my teachers thought I was uh, kind of slow. It takes them a long time. I had dyslexia. I couldn't copy from the board to my notes. I could never finish. So he's slow. He can't do this kind of work. Well, yeah, I can do the kind of work. It just takes me a little while longer. What can I say? <laughs> and one of the reasons that I started reading the suttas is because I have dyslexia. So when I read things, words jump around and do all kinds of things. So I wanted to train myself so that I could read in a proper way. Ante Wilmaramsi and his disciples, on the one hand, insist that he knows the true meanings of the words and phrases of the suttas, knows better than the Blessed One did how the Dhamma should be properly explained, has special insight into the meanings of various Pali words which differ greatly from the meaning implied by their context in the suttas. 
And yet, on the other hand, he both admits and demonstrates that he has a poor grasp of language, learning disabilities, difficulty understanding things, an undeveloped and sluggish intellect, and so on. Such impairments are common and not usually noteworthy. However, when a person with such an intellect is making extraordinary claims of understanding, the question must be asked. Couldn't he simply be mistaken, mixed up, hopelessly confused? Part of this is Bonte Wilmramsey's character. He was simply born with a dull intellect due to his comma or past actions. Part of this is due to his faculties dimming with age. But another part is due to the practice he promotes. All of the TWIM teachers exhibit poor comprehension of language, whether spoken or written down, which seems to increase in severity with their seniority in the organization. Students also report experiencing a dullness of mind that increases the more they practice. Bante Wilmaramsi clearly was not up to the task of interpreting these texts. He was unskilled in words and letters, unable to think clearly about complex matters, slow to recognize his mistakes, overconfident in his assumptions, ignorant of his influences. For everything he got right, he got even more than that wrong. He was unreasonable, unreachable by criticism. His followers were afraid to correct him even when they knew the things he was saying were not correct. And this all led him to a very dark place. Claim. Delson Armstrong is an air haunt. Hmm. When you s said there that you had the experience twice, uh, twice in the same day, uh, do you, uh, am I to take that to mean that you attained to the second and third paths within the same day? Well, the, the second path, the path and the fruition of the second. Oh, I see. Yes. Yeah. And then later on, subsequently, uh, the rest of the paths and, and fruitions. So that's basically what we're talking at that point is... Uh, I mean, I kind of summarize it, but what I'm talking about there is your your level of understanding of dependent origination and, and the clarity becomes oh, yes. even greater. And what happens is you start to realize, especially at the final attainment, which is really what we're talking about, which happened much later on. We've just heard Delson say that he has attained all four paths and fruitions. For some reason, he declines to make his claim of arahantship in a straightforward way. His teacher, Bhante Wilmaramsi, being ostensibly bound by the rules for monks, at least had some reason for being indirect about his claims. But why would Delson, a layman, need to avoid addressing the matter directly? So, Delson has claimed that he is an arahant. But what is an arahant? An arahant is a worthy one, a perfected one, totally freed from greed, hatred, and delusion, having severed all ten fetters, self-identity views, uncertainty, clinging to rites and rituals, sensual desire, ill will, craving for form, craving for formlessness, conceit, restlessness, and ignorance. An arahant by definition, has a comprehensive, effective understanding of the Dhamma. They have penetrated the deepest truth by direct knowledge and have no perplexity regarding the way things really are. It is inconceivable that an Arahant, knowing the true teaching, aware of the dangers of false teachings, would promote or encourage others in a false teaching. And yet, in the following clip, in which Delson describes his unusual relationship with Greg Halpern, he does promote and encourage Greg's views. Uh, can you tell us a bit about the man you met who had 13 near-death experiences? Yeah, this was an interesting one. So I, I spent about, about five or six years with this person. Um, so this was back when I was still in New York, uh, New York City, and I was uh, a ghostwriter at the time. So I had uh, just basically got, gotten back to New York uh, started getting into the film world and screenwriting and ghostwriting and so on. And I heard about this project about this man who wanted to write uh, a biography about himself, an autobiography. So he was looking for a ghostwriter. 
And he basically said that I've had 13 near death experiences and I'm looking for somebody who can write my story, but more importantly, has some spiritual understanding, some kind of degree of experience in the meditative arts, in the spiritual arts, so to speak. So I signed up for the assignment and, you know, I gave him a, um, well, he, he got my message. He gave me a call, left me a voicemail and he was in San Diego at the time. That's how I went to San Diego. So I returned the call and uh, we had a good discussion about what my experience was in terms of my writing experience and then spiritual experience. And then the last thing he said before he, uh, we ended the call was, okay, great. So when can you come down to San Diego? And I said, how about this weekend? I think it was around a Tuesday or Wednesday at the time. So he said, how about this weekend? And I said, okay, that's fine. He sent me a ticket and I visited his place uh, in San Diego. At the time he was living uh, somewhere in uh, Del Mar for those of for those who might be in, uh, knowing where you know, that, that might be in San Diego. But anyway, uh, I went and visited him and he told me his story. And over that weekend, basically I recorded the whole story, his whole entire life story. And why is it that he had these 13 near-death experiences? And what were those near-death experiences? And what happened as a result of those near-death experiences? Now, at the time, I was in a different frame of mind. So this was when I was just starting out my career and I was more interested in, let's say, making a name for myself in a writing career and being able to make a little bit of money and so on and so forth. Now, this person that I met, he um, he had a very interesting life. He, he has led a couple of public companies uh, and he has a fairly wealthy lifestyle and so on and so forth. And so at that time, with that frame of mind, I asked him, how is it that you did this? Like, what was it that made you be able to manifest these things? And he said, well, if you want to learn it, why don't, why don't you become my protege? And so I asked him, can you be my mentor? And so that was the beginning of our, let's say, six year journey into this. And the 13 year death experiences that he had. So he had them at various stages of his life. The first one he had was when he was very young as a child. Uh, and it opened up uh, what he calls channels and pathways in his mind. And he accessed a different dimension. Uh, according to his description, he accessed this portal and this place where it was very similar to what you would see or hear about different near-death experiences. The commonality being going through a tunnel and seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. And he heard voices and he heard different kinds of voices about you know, going back uh, to the earth plane and continuing his life. But what he found was when he came back, it, it opened up, as he said, the, the channel pathways to certain kinds of skills, or let's say certain kinds of uh, assets of personality. For example, as a kid, he developed a great sense of humor and he started to understand how humor opens up the heart, as he said, it, it opens up the heart center because you're able to better connect with a person if you're able to make them laugh and uh, make them feel at ease and so on. And then he he also had some, let's say, drug experiences as well. At the time, it was, I think, the 70s or 80s. So he, he did some acid trips and he overdosed on cocaine and things like that. So he had different near-death experiences to that. He had a shroom trip, uh, a couple of car accidents, uh, and different kinds of things. And then the 12th near-death experience was very close to where where we are in the present in terms of the timeline. And what he said was, this time around, when he came back from his near-death experience, what happened here in his 12th near-death experience was, he was in Chicago at the time with his family, and it was August, so it was quite hot, quite uh, uh, quite humid. And he was trying to change uh, something with the the pool, the swimming pool, and it was the the, uh, the chlorine filter or something. And when he opened it up, he inhaled the chlorine gas, and it made him go into, you know, arrest, like cardiac arrest or whatever, and then, he just had an experience and when he came back from it uh he what he said was it was it felt like a, a bunch of information just downloaded into his mind and it was like he had connected to the ether he had finally connected to what he called was the ether and experienced what he called were these principles like three thousand principles of life and it was from as he puts it some other kind of let's say interdimensional or extraterrestrial uh, intelligence. Um, and, and so it was, it, was, it was a collection of thoughts of wisdom in different facets of life. So I had a chance over that six year period to be able to be mentored in those principles and get a sense of what these principles were all about. And they were related to opening up your, your different chakras and different centers in the spine. They were related to, uh, you know, how to how to live a life where you're always happy, 
um, how to live a life in which you are experiencing abundance, not only, let's say, in, in terms of wealth or money, but also in terms of experiences and relationships, emotional connections and things like that. So it was a multifaceted approach to living the best life that you could. So that was that was a very, very important stage in my life, I would say, those six years, to be able to learn from him. And, uh, you know, he, he's still there in San Diego, he's doing his own thing, and he has developed his own, let's say, program or his own methodology of teaching these things. And, uh, you know, he, he and I stay in touch uh, quite often. Uh, so I'm, I'm very grateful for those experiences that I've had with is he a public teacher? Uh, I would say he's semi-public. I mean, he's open to being able to talk to people openly. You know, uh, I, he has appeared on a lot of different talk shows. Uh, he's appeared on Oprah uh, many, many, many years ago for something else that he's done. So he is okay and comfortable in the public eye. Uh, right now, I think he's repackaging, if you will, those those elements of teachings that he has and delivering them in a way that's you know accessible through the internet and so on. Mm. With your experience of different contemplative traditions, do you recognize um, his methodology or the, the, either the principles or the means of exploring them? Do they remind you of any or have any similarities to any other contemplative traditions or philosophies that you're aware of? They do, but with an interesting twist. Uh, because he, it was interesting because the information that he received, as he says, uh, is according to him and according to the way he's received that transmission. Uh, delivered in a way that is unique in terms of its its messaging, in terms of the way that it's messaged. But I do find certain connections to Tantra. Uh, I, I find certain connections to the Siddha tradition. The reason I say that is because this is a very life-affirming kind of practice. It's a, It uses energy centers to definitely get into deep states of meditation and to get into deep states of uh, insight and, and wisdom and so on. But it doesn't just stop there. It also talks about what is the best way to live life to the fullest. So I find a lot of similarities in that sense from certain elements of Tantra and certain elements of the Siddha tradition, which is the South Indian yogic tradition, which is all about how do you live in the world uh, while still maintaining some level of higher consciousness. Um, and, and so being both in the mundane and in the super mundane territories. I noticed you haven't mentioned his name yet. Uh, is that <laughs> deliberate? Oh, well, his name is his name is uh, Greg Halpern. Greg Halpern. You can look him up. Greg Halpern. Oh, okay. Very interesting. In that story, you, you mentioned uh, various different psychedelic uh, compounds yeah. and also uh, you know drugs like cocaine and so on that Greg had used. Have you yourself uh, experimented with any psychoactive substances, either recreationally or um, in contemplative contexts? Who is this man, Greg Halpern? Delson's mentor and personal friend. The point I'm making is there's a simple Pleiadian exercise that you can do today. And according to one of my protégés who all his yogis came back and studied what he had learned in three months, what it took them 40 years to learn and said, oh my God, we were bored out of our skulls. It was painful. If we could have learned in three months, we would have skipped all that. That's okay. amazing. And everybody with no experience or massive uh, buy into meditation or uh, let's say the advanced work that you're already doing can use this to take all that and level up to their best version with no learning curve by watching and listening. So they can get a formula for a protocol, the level up program, and then there's three sets of programs. One with those basic elements you just said, one with the middle stuff, which is sleep, energy, uh, uh, relationships and manifest positive immediate manifestation. And the last one is four meditations. One that balances left and right brain in six minutes and puts your dopamine even with both brains. One that creates perfect clarity with the man head and the woman heart for throat unification. So when you speak, your speak is perfectly coordinated with your thoughts and your beliefs are, your feelings are working with your thoughts instead of against each other so that your speech is perfectly identical to both being in complete harmony. And then there's rapid healing meditation, which will take tackle at just about anything and then incredible health which is kind of what i use and it has you know hundreds of elements both analog and digital that literally can undust a person can neutralize their cells down to the atomic particle level so the people that are worried about the fact that bill gates for example i, I track all his work 
he's in the bioweapons business, but when he's not doing that, he takes all the rest of his money because there's no foundation. And he invested in Monsanto, which is poisoning the earth, the air, the water, and the food. Okay. Having done thousands of very unusual things, for example, your show, uh, I, I, I see that you have profound things that you're talking about hypnosis and you're talking about law of attraction and you're talking about things that, you know, well, let's just say if I had all that stuff, is there a chance I might know some of this stuff? Well, let's put it this way. I worked with Bill Erickson, the modern father of hypnosis before he died by chance, just by chance. I worked with this protege who her and him taught me at the same time, unusual. I worked with Dolores Cannon before she died for a brief moment on quantum healing hypnosis therapy. And I worked with Molly Bay, who was a disciple of those earlier people to create hypnosis that was proven to neutralize terminal cancers uh, stage four where people have been given up on it was scientifically proven to neutralize your cells to a healthy neutral point down to the atomic particle level just through the visuals well four are meditations and eight are pure courses like pure sleep courses. sleep is really uh undervalued right because i sleep I, I used to sleep three hours a night after my injury uh for you know 30 some years but now i i don't sleep from monday through friday and i sleep uh nine hours on the weekend a six hour and a three hour which kind of defies the known science it says you will age faster but with this content and with the resources that you can get you can age, you can reverse age by two or three decades if you're you no know, old guy like me and in, in your mid six going to your mid 60s and i got well i had been to pleiades but it it was not in my memory at that time i'd had one one life on pleiades of a thousand years which is an average lifespan there because it's the nearest star field earth but as you know the time space continuum sets different times when you're different places and and then secondly uh this is my primary other life on earth and then when that's done i'm pretty much done because i packed it all in real tight and and really i believe i came here according to all the visits I've had recently over the last 10 years, something weird started happening about 20 years ago. Uh, I would be with somebody and they'd say, oh, I had this dream last night. I said, was I in it? And they said, uh-huh. And I said, were there a bunch of other people that you didn't recognize in there standing around you and you're on a, like you were on a table? Uh-huh. And did that disease or illness that you've been fighting for the last several years, it looks pretty hopeless and pretty terminal, like it's going to harm you real bad. Does that seem like that's gone now? Uh-huh. Well, why don't you go get it tested and find out if it was because, you know, we did our little thing in that dream. <laughs> it's funny when they have the same dream as you do. And these are people that I was close to over the years and it happened several times. And they, and then they would go get tested and their, their stage four cancers or whatever were miraculously gone. And the doctors or the hospitals will always say, well, we must have made a mistake in the first place. This has got to be somebody else's test or something's wrong here. You know, it was always like that. But I was keenly aware of that. This relationship with Craig tells us something important about Delson's character. Delson was gullible enough, impressionable, easily led, easily manipulated, suggestible, hypnotizable enough, even after all of his supposed yoga mastery as to be taken in by Greg and convinced that Greg had true knowledge and wisdom. So taken in that Delson committed six years of his life to studying Greg's teachings. He was so impressed by Greg's show of wealth that he didn't bother to investigate where that money had really come from or what kind of business practices Greg had been involved in. He ate up everything that Greg was serving him, hook, line and sinker. And even after leaving Greg's home, Delson appears not to have escaped his influence, claiming that he's grateful for the experience. Recall that Delson moved in with Greg around 2010-2011, lived with him for six years, and then joined TWIM in 2016. This left no time for any character development. Delson went straight from Greg's hypnosis and indoctrination directly into Bhante Willem Ramses. We're expected to believe that an Arahant could fail to realize the nature of Greg's character in retrospect. This is not possible. An Arahant would have no difficulty warning people of the danger of these false teachers and their false teachings. The Blessed One made many such warnings regarding the false teachers of his time. Men who held views 
identical to those espoused by Greg Halpern. There's a lot of very trippy, if you will, concepts in the Yoga Vashista that talk about space and time, uh, that talk about, you know, time dilation, not only in terms of the physics of it, but also the idea that, you know, when you go travel vast distances from one planet to the other, there is a difference in the way you experience time and how people on Earth would experience time. So that's all talked about. Uh, they talk about uh, things like, you know, just as we have the experience of this world as we are living on it in this on this planet, there's an experience of bacteria and protozoa that are living off of us. And then he talks about it on a super macro level where he talks about how there are beings living on different galaxies. So it's a very cosmic trip and I would recommend it, but it's a, it's a long read. It's a huge, huge read. It took me a good two years to go through it, you know? So uh, that's the Yoga Vishista. And then within, within let's say Tantra, when we talk about Tantra, we have to understand, you know, there's this idea that Tantra has to do with sexuality. And there are, there is, some aspects of that when it comes to sexuality but tantra is really all it really means is technique we have three different words we have mantra we have tantra and we have yantra mantra is the 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 concentration of the mind using a specific syllable let's say or specific sound tantra is the technique through which you do that process and yantra is these different mechanisms that you can use like for example uh you can use rudraksha beads uh, you could use mercury and I've gone through this process of seeing how mercury is solidified using certain kinds of herbs so that it, it's it's used uh, as a carrier for energies and so there's different kinds of amulets and different kinds of crystals and different kinds of metals that you can use which is that process of yantra so I've, I've seen what are known as the siddha yogis actually you uh, take solidified mercury in their hand and take certain kinds of herbs that are found only in South India and parts of the Himalayas. And they mix that up. And what it does is it kind of purifies the mercury and it creates this little kind of uh, gelatinous ball, if you will. And then they do other kinds of processes. They chant mantras into it. And then it becomes this very dense metal ball. And the understanding is that within Siddha tradition, you can actually elevate that mercury to create consciousness in it, conscious energies. And you can make it into your guru, if you will. So I've seen uh, different kinds of mercury balls or solidified mercury do different kinds of things. So you can use them to awaken psychic faculties. You can use them to elevate your mental level and elevate the Kundalini and things like that. Repeatedly, Delson is given the opportunity to point out exactly what is wrong with these views and practices, exactly how they do not lead one who practices them to the total end of suffering. But rather than doing as an arahant would do, he chooses instead to encourage others to pursue that which is dangerous and misleading. I know you're a big mo movie buff. What's yeah. your favorite movie of all time? Star Wars, The Empire Strikes Back, and I'll tell you why. <laughs> please do. <laughs> please, please expand. Look, I mean, the whole Star Wars trilogy is great, right? But The Empire Strikes Back is the first time you meet Yoda. And that's the first time you get really deep wisdom into things that were, you know, the, the Jedi and the Jedi Order were really inspired from the ancient spiritual traditions, right. specifically Buddhism. Yeah. So, and Empire Strikes Back is just a great movie. Yeah. I mean, just in terms of cinematic appeal, it's got a great story, great characters, great script, great dialogue, yeah. all of those things. Now, it is difficult to choose one movie, but I would have to say, since this is a rapid fire, that's yeah. the movie I would choose. Apparently, Delson is well known as a movie enthusiast. This is a striking contradiction. This is what the Blessed One had to say about the matter. As long as they live, the Arahants abstain from dancing, singing, music, watching shows, wearing garlands, beautifying themselves with perfumes and cosmetics. Today, I too, for this day and night, abstain from dancing, singing, music, watching shows, wearing garlands, beautifying myself with perfumes and cosmetics. By means of this factor, I emulate the Arahants 
and myoposita will be observed. Take a close look at Delson Armstrong's face and ask yourself, is this the face of an Arahant, a perfected one? And then ultimately, the fruit of this meditation, the fruit of any practice of meditation within the Dhamma, is nirvana itself. It is the total, irreversible, unshakable, permanent change and shift in perspective, so that one achieves a level of awakening in which one understands the true nature of reality. Delson expects us to believe that he understands the true nature of reality without understanding moderation in eating. In this video, we can see that his body is so overstuffed with carbohydrates that the skin of his face is oozing pus. The Arahants were said to have clear, bright complexions, and yet Delson's complexion falls far short of that precedent. We also find it noteworthy that he exhibits strabismus, otherwise known as lazy eye. He is not the only person with lazy eye who is today claiming full enlightenment. It's too complex of a matter to address in depth here, but there are perceptual distortions associated with lazy eye which it is conceivable that a person could misinterpret as representing some kind of attainment. If a person with strabismus tells you that they perceive the world differently than other people. That may in fact be true, but it is also meaningless, having nothing whatsoever to do with the Dhamma. What did the Blessed One have to say about Arahants and moderation in eating? And how does the disciple of the Noble Ones know moderation in eating? There is the case where a disciple of the Noble Ones, considering it appropriately, takes his food not playfully, nor for intoxication, nor for putting on bulk, nor for beautification, but simply for the survival and continuance of this body, for ending its afflictions, for the support of the holy life, thinking, I will destroy old feelings from hunger, and not create new feelings from overeating. Thus, I will maintain myself, be blameless, and live in comfort. This is how the disciple of the Noble Ones knows moderation in eating. The following video was published on November 8th, 2021, just three days after the release of the Guru Viking interview, in which Delson claims to be an Arahant. When I was talking with Delson about this, uh, the uh, man that's an Anagami, he, uh, what? <laughs> oh, you made me forget what I was going to say. So we can see that Bhante Wimaramsi, Delson's own teacher, did not believe Delson's claim of Arahantship. We think the following clips offer possible explanations as to why he felt this way. He understands thus, birth is destroyed, the holy life has been lived, what had to be done has been done. There is no more coming to any state of being. Now this last statement is for Arahats. If you get to be an Arahat, that's going to come up automatically in your mind. And some, some of my students, they have had that come up in their mind, but they still laughed out loud. And when you laugh, that shows you're not an Arahat yet. Uh, supposedly Arahats were writing these commentaries, but I'm sure it wasn't only Arahats because there's some mistakes and things. Now, an, an, an Anagami, uh, I don't have any students that have gone any further than this. And there's not that many students that actually have attained this. It's, it's quite a high degree of awareness. And I've told all of the students that I have that if they become an, an Arahat, 
then I want to be their first student. And I want to study with them the finer points of things that I don't understand yet. So. This was a good thought that Bonte Wilmaramsi had, that it was possible for him to learn something from his students. Unfortunately, due to his own actions and his clinging to wrong view, this scenario would never come to pass. Think of not having anything disturb mind at all for seven days. Now you sit, your heart doesn't beat, you don't breathe anymore. Family members can get upset and think you're dead because they don't hear the heartbeat. Another reason that Bonte Wilmaramsi may have disbelieved Delson's claims is that they had a difference of opinion regarding the state known as Niroda Samapati, the attainment of cessation. Bhante Wimaramsi adhered to the traditional view, stating that the heart and breath cease in this state, and that to an outside observer who lacks special insight into the matter, the person in such a state appears to be dead. Delson was studied by some medical researchers when supposedly in this state, and they found his heart and breath rate to be consistent with the ordinary waking state. Delson, believing that he was already fully enlightened, decided to revise this traditional account to fit his narrative. Scientific findings seem to suggest your heart rate and respiration were at normal levels. Right. And so, Presumably, normal levels of heartbeat and respiration are easy to detect, even, even yeah. for people of an, in the ancient past, right, throughout history. Yeah. It doesn't quite follow, does it? It's easy to claim to be fully awakened. More than that, today, it's fashionable. It's even possible to live like an arahant without being one although very few who are making this claim today have bothered to try. They must think that their audiences aren't discerning enough to see through the charade. This statement we've just heard by Steve James seems to be the perfect summary of the situation with Delson Armstrong. It doesn't quite follow, does it? This is one of the few instances in which Steve James has called out one of his guests on a contradiction. Much harm could have been avoided if he had only pressed a little harder. Indeed, it doesn't follow. There's a lot about this story that doesn't add up, that raises important questions which no one is willing to answer. People overestimate their attainments all the time. This is nothing new. Even 2,600 years ago, it was a common occurrence. But to do it so publicly, to be given such a platform, such support, that doesn't happen every day. And this turns something that could have been a minor personal setback, a small embarrassment, into a grave error from which it may be impossible to recover. Perhaps even Bonte Wilmaramsi recognized the danger in that. Delson seems to be at least subconsciously aware that it would be highly inappropriate for him to announce this attainment straightforwardly. Having an Arahant alive in the world is a very good thing, a thing that any being having good intentions would like to see. But following someone falsely claiming to be an Arahant, that is exceptionally dangerous. We must not ignore these red flags. We must not allow these questions to go unasked or unanswered. Claim. Compassion has an esoteric meaning which doesn't involve the intention to prevent harm. A lot of people use the word compassion and they get it mixed up with loving kindness, which is a little bit different. Again, I won't tell you what the difference is because people have to tell me. So I know that you're in that state. The definition of compassion is seeing another person in pain, allowing them the space to have their pain and love them without question. That is a definition of compassion that I use. 
That's what true compassion really is. It's not feeling sorry for somebody else and wishing that they didn't have that suffering. What's the definition of compassion? Compassion is seeing another person in pain, allowing them the space to have their pain and love them no matter what. A definition of compassion that I use very often is a lot different than what other people call compassion. I uh, used to go and visit people at the hospitals. And I did that for about a year. And I was going every day. Somebody would come and say, well, my, my relative is sick and I want you to come visit them and that sort of thing. So while I was walking in the hallway to go to the room where the person was, I would remind myself what compassion truly is. Compassion is seeing another person that is suffering allow the space for them to suffer and radiate loving kindness unconditionally to that person and they talk about infinite compassion and they say that's what the buddha sat in in meditation every morning well what he was actually sitting in was infinite space and radiating compassion it's just a little misunderstanding that they have you start feeling a quieter loving kindness now you will realize that there is less warmth, less movement of the metta, it is softer, like cotton. This is karuna, or compassion. You have gone beyond the coarser state of loving-kindness, and entered a more sublime, tranquil state. The Situatans have a secret definition of compassion, one that differs greatly from both the common understanding of the word and the explanations given by the Blessed One. Normally, they don't share this definition with their students. Rather, they will ask the student leading questions about this cottony feeling in the forehead. And when the student says they've experienced that, they will then tell them that the feeling in their head is compassion. However, in a few instances, they have slipped up and mentioned this feeling in their talks or their teacher training materials. It's important to understand that whenever the Sutuvedans are discussing compassion, it is just this cottony feeling in the forehead that they are referring to. This misrepresentation has serious consequences. The Sutuvedans believe that they have developed their compassion either very much or fully. But what they have developed is not, in fact, compassion. It is only this cottony feeling in their foreheads which has nothing to do with compassion. This allows them to think and act out of harmfulness, which is something a person having developed their compassion could not do. Feelings of any kind are called by the Noble Ones Vedana. There are three kinds of feeling, pleasant feeling, painful feeling, and neither pleasant nor painful feeling. Compassion is not a Vedana or feeling. Rather, it is a Chetana, an attitude or disposition. A person can commit murder while having a pleasant, cottony feeling in their forehead, but a person, having fully developed their compassion, could not do this. A teacher who has underdeveloped compassion may have no problem harming their students, as we see in the case of the Sutuedans. But nevertheless, he may, by this trick of using secret definitions, believe that he is being compassionate when he does so. What did the Blessed One say about compassion. And further, there is the case where a monk might say, although compassion has been developed, pursued, handed the reins, taken as a basis, steadied, consolidated, and well undertaken by me as my awareness release, still, harmfulness keeps overwhelming my mind. He should be told, don't say that, you shouldn't speak in that way. Don't misrepresent the Blessed One, or it's not right to misrepresent the Blessed One, and the Blessed One wouldn't say that. It's impossible. There's no way that, when compassion has been developed, pursued, handed the reins, taken as a basis, steadied, consolidated, and well undertaken as an awareness release, harmfulness would still keep overpowering the mind. That possibility doesn't exist for this is the escape from harmfulness, compassion as an awareness release. 
The Sutuedans are well aware that their instructions are causing very serious harm to students who follow them ardently, but they continue to knowingly and intentionally give out those harmful instructions without even warning of the risks. This is not compassionate. This is evil. This is psychopathic. Claim. Loving kindness, meta, can be directed to heal others or to charge water with healing powers. And I was against this too. Take a, like a quart jar of clean water and hold it while you're sending loving and kind thoughts to your, to your mother and your family members. And if you feel anything coming on, a cold, or you start feeling not as healthy as you could, start drinking that water. Water holds energy. They've, been, they've proved that a long time ago in, in Japan. And you're putting loving kindness back into your body, and that makes everything more healthy. And I'll explain this too. Uh, when I was in Malaysia, there was a woman that was pregnant that she wanted me to uh, give her a blessing. And I, I, I took a bottle of water and I held it while I was doing the chanting, and then I was radiating loving kindness for about a half an hour, and I gave her that water. And I told her any time the, the baby in, in her body became over uh, anxious and, and moving around a lot, take some of that water and just massage the baby, and the baby would calm down very quickly after that. And when she finally had the baby, it came with very, I, I know there's a lot of pain in childbirth, but it wasn't as long as it had been with other uh, children that she'd had. It was very fast, it was only a few hours that she was in labor. And when the baby came out, the baby came out smiling. And it did really odd things. Now, I know a lot of babies, when, they, when they're born, the first six months or eight months, they're crying all the time. But she did weird things. This little girl would sleep all night without crying. And that was very amazing. And the first time I went to go see her, she saw me and she put her hands together like this. After that, it got real popular, and a lot of pregnant women were coming and practicing with me, and I gave them water. <laughs> so I, there was 27 or 30 different families that I called them my kids. They're, they're grown now, so that's, they were my kids because I gave them the water, and it helped them to have a happier life, more accepting. So do that, and send some water to her. Okay, thank you. And tell, tell her to take a sip every day. Now, if she starts to run out, Wait till she gets about a quarter full of, of say, a quart jar, a pint jar, whatever, and put more distilled water in it and shake it 15 times. And that will re-energize all of that water so that it doesn't run out. Okay? Okay. And that, that, that will help her mind be more peaceful and calm. And it will help your mind be more peaceful <laughs> and calm. But the strange thing is, and they can measure this with some of the scientific things, if you radiate loving kindness around you, it goes out. 500 feet is, is as much as they can measure. I don't believe that. I believe it goes out further than that, by a lot. And I've had a lot of examples of people in over problems. There was, I was in America, and one of my old students from Malaysia had just had a baby, and she had jaundice. And they were very concerned about that. I mean, she, she wasn't, um, I think she was two days old before she started turning yellow. And the parents were in fear for their life, for her life. So what they did was call me up and say, what am I supposed to do? And I said, well, you have to start radiating loving kindness to your baby. I know you love your baby, but she needs a little bit extra. She needs a boost. And I will do the same thing. And I started sending loving kindness to the little baby. I can't remember her name right now. And they were in a room with the baby, and they saw the color of the baby start changing from jaundice to regular color. And they called up again. And they said, when did you start doing that? And I said, well, I started doing that right after you called me. And they said, whatever you're doing is weird. It's amazing. Even in the room, I can feel your presence. Isn't that a miracle? And it's on the other side of the world. And there's no, I mean, as, hard as, as soon as I started doing it, things started changing. I was not sending her love in an attached way. I was just wishing her to have a healthy, happy body. You can do the same thing. I'm nothing special. I'm somebody that prefers to be a monk to being a layman, so I have more time to do the things I want to do. That's the only difference between you and me. Why can't you do that for the rest of the world? You will affect the world in a positive way, and it's not only limited to your neighborhood. One of the things that at the, at the, the last retreat I gave in uh, Kuala Lumpur, 
I started talking to them about using forgiveness with any kind of physical howie. And you stub your toe, you cut your, you burn yourself, whatever. Start forgiving right then. And then test on the forgiveness. The next time that happens, don't forgive and see how long, how much longer it takes to heal. Because it's amazing. Same? Right. The more you can forgive little things as you're going along, the easier it becomes to forgive the big things when they come. And the faster you heal. I mean, it's, it's amazing. I, I have a wood-burning stove at home. And sometimes I get burned. Now, when I, when I start paying attention to that and I start forgiving it, by the next day I don't even have a blister. All I have is a red spot. Two or three days later, it's all gone. Then when I don't, I've got a problem for a week. And I have a blister and I have a lot of pain. So it's a difference of two or three days or a week. It's up to me whether I do it or not. So the more you can remember to do the forgiveness with your any kind of owie, whether it's a mental owie or a physical owie, you do the forgiveness, the pain is going to disappear more quickly. One of the things that I highly recommend everybody do, I want you to get a glass bottle or a glass uh, drinking cup that you can put a lid on. And I want you to put distilled water in it. I want you to hold that while you are radiating loving kindness to all beings in all directions. I want you to do it every day for as long as you want to do it. Then if you start feeling a cold coming on, take a sip. If one of your family members starts to get sick, have them drink some, take some in your hand and give them a massage. There is benefit in doing that, especially for pregnant women. I radiate loving kindness while holding a, just one time, holding a, a glass, a, a bottle of water. It has to be distilled water. It can't be bubbly water or tap water. It has to be distilled. Then one of the things that they found out about water is the water holds memory. And that's been proven scientifically. But you have to use the water. Now, if you want to really see results fast, start pouring that water, giving a, a plant a drink that's sickly, and watch what happens. All of a sudden, they start loving you because you're helping them. See, this is a generosity thing again. The more times you can come up with ways to help the world around you in a positive way, please do that and tell us about it. Because that'll inspire a lot of other people to do something that's very positive, that's very helpful. Excuse me. And do that every time you sit. Hold that water in your hands. And use that water. Now you go down about half a bottle, fill it up with distilled water, shake it 15 times. I don't know why 15 works, but shake it 15 times. It's infused with that loving kindness, that memory of loving kindness and well-being and you'll never run out. Even 2,600 years ago, we had water and containers for water. And yet, not once in the discourses of the Blessed One, which record the 45 years in which he taught the Dhamma, is this practice ever described or even hinted at. There are, however, many instances of monks being afflicted by disease and injury, and yet there is not a single case of loving-kindness or forgiveness being used to cure them. Monks were not forming circles, joining hands, and radiating metta, as the Sutuadans do. They were not charging water or crystals with healing energies. What they did was use medicine or seek the services of a surgeon. Monks even went to the Blessed One, describing their maladies, and he told them which medicines or bodily treatments they were permitted to use. One would think that if such healing with metta were possible, they could have saved a lot of time, effort, and suffering by doing that instead of using medicines and surgery. Even the Blessed One himself fell ill on numerous occasions. 
when his foot was penetrated by a sliver of rock on the occasion that his cousin Devadatta attempted to kill him. It became infected and inflamed. The monks did not form a healing circle, did not perform a ritual involving the charging of water. Rather, they sent for a surgeon to tend to his foot. This idea that Bhante Wilmaramsi promoted didn't come from the teaching of the Noble Ones. It came primarily from a man who called himself Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. He claimed full enlightenment and promoted a meditation practice that he called Transcendental Meditation. He was a widely influential cult leader of the 1960s and 70s, most famous for having been the guru of the musical group The Beatles before they became disillusioned with him after they heard that he had inappropriate sexual contact with Mia Farrow. His ideas have totally permeated the New Age movement, and Bhante Wilmaramsi was heavily influenced by them. Not only in terms of his beliefs regarding healing and other powers, but with the meditation practice itself, the negative side effects of TM and TWIM are similar, if not identical, and it seems that Bhante Wilmaramsi modeled much of his thinking on the Maharishi's teaching, whether consciously or unconsciously. This is a theme with Bhante Wilmaramsi. On many occasions, he regurgitated false teachings that he had picked up from the New Age movement, presenting them as truth while wearing the ochre robes of a monk, leaving his audience to naturally assume that this information had come down through his Theravadan Buddhist lineage, when in fact it did not. These were little more than old wives' tales he picked up in his life as a Reiki energy healer and New Age follower, long before his ordination as a monk. We have personally seen and heard of students of the Situadans foregoing medical treatments and instead relying on these prayer circles or faith healing practices, asking other Situadans to radiate metta to them in order to heal them of their afflictions. Furthermore, whenever Bhante Wilmaramsi got sick, David Johnson would send out a call for donations so that he could see a doctor and get medical treatment. And yet, Many of his students had been convinced by his rhetoric that they didn't need to seek proper medical treatment for their illnesses. When people have called out this contradiction, David Johnson has belittled them and threatened to ban them from the TWIM discussion forum. It is also worth noting that despite having been the spiritual friend to whom thousands of his students have spent countless hours radiating metta, this offered no relief from any of his many health problems for which he still had to seek the assistance of doctors. None of this was able to bring him back from his psychotic state or prevent his death. Claim. Twim can cure cancer. Very few people died of cancer before the 1700s. Was The reason was that, that they were giving them baking soda. Yeah. And it overcomes that. So it's quite interesting. Uh, I had another student that uh, quite some years ago, uh, she was on her deathbed. The doctor said in, within uh, six weeks to two months, she was going to be dead with cancer. And uh, somebody took me to see her and I, I did some chanting and that sort of thing for her. And she asked if there's anything that she could do. And I said, well, you need to forgive all the pains that you've gone through, the pain of the physical pain, forgive the pain for being there, forgive other people for causing you pain, forgive yourself for causing other people pain. Now there was one lady in Malaysia, I told this story a couple days ago, that she, she came to me and she told me that she was going to die in about one month. The doctor said the cancer, there was nothing they could do, the cancer was so bad that she was going to die and she asked what she could do so that she could be happy for that one month. So I told her to buy an animal and let it go free and focus on happiness coming into her mind. She went out to the fishing boats and they have little fish that they use as bait. She bought 100 fish and she, then she would take it out and let it go free in the ocean and she became very happy. She did this every day. 
after about six weeks, she went to the doctor because she felt good. She didn't feel sick. And the doctor examined her. And the doctor said, what have you been doing? What kind of medicine are you taking? I want to know about this. And she said, I quit taking medicine. I went down and I bought fish and I let them go free. Every day. That's all I've done different. She didn't have any cancer. The cancer went away. The gift of life is very, very powerful. Bhante Wilmaramsi often repeated these claims of curing cancer. Sometimes they involved folk remedies like baking soda and castor oil. Other times, the focus was on the twim forgiveness practice. Although this may seem quaint and trivial to some, many people take such statements very seriously, such as the woman in his story who stopped taking her medication and started buying up and releasing bait fish instead. So what did Sister Kema do when she was diagnosed with stage 4 cancer? After having practiced twim, including the forgiveness meditation, for 20 years, did she rely on baking soda water, castor oil, fish rescue, and forgiveness? If she did any of these things, she didn't mention them. What she did mention was that she needed the Sutuaid and lay followers to give her money to go to a hospital for conventional medical treatment. You'd think, if this forgiveness cure was going to work for anyone, it would work for an accomplished twin meditator such as Sister Kema, Bhante Wimaramsi's chief disciple. But no, she went to a doctor, secure in the knowledge that all of her expenses would be paid by the same people she had helped to mislead into thinking forgiveness would cure their own cancers. Claim. Bonte Vimalaramsi can cure AIDS. This statement appeared in a talk given by Bonte Wilmaramsi and uploaded to YouTube. In this video, he told a story that he often told in order to lead people to believe that he had superhuman levels of pain tolerance. In this story, he receives a root canal from a dentist without anesthesia because of his concern that the needle used to inject the Novocaine might be contaminated with HIV. In this particular telling, he added that if he did get AIDS, it would be okay because he knew how to get rid of it. Many people heard this statement and, naturally, had questions about it. When Bhante Wilmramsi's steward, David Johnson, the person who manages the channel where the video was posted, became aware of these discussions, he removed the evidence without explanation. In forum posts, he denied that Bhante Wilmramsi had ever made such a statement, or he offered speculation as to what he really meant by it, or he threatened to ban a follower who asked a reasonable question about the matter and called him foolish and disrespectful. There are two concerning issues here. The first being Bhante Wumramsi's claim to know how to cure AIDS. This is problematic for the same reasons as his cancer cure claims. The second is David Johnson's cover-up operation. This is part of a pattern of behavior with David Johnson, wherein his attachment to his beloved guru was more important to him than upholding the truth or making genuine progress on the noble Eightfold Path. This is what the Blessed One told his son Rahula about lying. Then, the Blessed One, having left a little bit of the remaining water in the water dipper, said to Venerable Rahula, Rahula, do you see this little bit of remaining water left in the water dipper? Yes, sir. That's how little of a contemplative there is in anyone who feels no shame at telling a deliberate lie. Having tossed away the little bit of remaining water, the Blessed One said to Venerable Rahula, Rahula, do you see how this little bit of remaining water is tossed away? Yes, sir. Rahula, Whatever there is of a contemplative in anyone who feels no shame at telling a deliberate lie is tossed away just like that. Having turned the water dipper upside down, the Blessed One said to Venerable Rahula, Rahula, 
Do you see how this water dipper is turned upside down? Yes, sir. Rahula, whatever there is of a contemplative in anyone who feels no shame at telling a deliberate lie is turned upside down just like that. Having turned the water dipper upside down, the Blessed One said to Venerable Rahula, Rahula, do you see how empty and hollow this water dipper is? Yes, sir. Rahula, whatever there is of a contemplative in anyone who feels no shame at telling a deliberate lie is empty and hollow, just like that. Rahula, it's like a royal elephant, immense, pedigreed, accustomed to battles, its tusks like chariot poles. Having gone into battle, it uses its forefeet and hindfeet, its forequarters and hindquarters, its head and ears and tusks and tail, but will simply hold back its trunk. The elephant trainer notices that and thinks, this royal elephant has not given up its life to the king, but when the royal elephant, immense, pedigreed, accustomed to battles, its tusks like chariot poles, having gone into battle, uses its forefeet and hindfeet, its forequarters and hindquarters, its head and ears and tusks and tail, and his trunk. The trainer notices that and thinks, this royal elephant has given up its life to the king. There is nothing it will not do. In the same way, Rahula, when anyone feels no shame in telling a deliberate lie, there is no evil, I tell you, he will not do. Thus, Rahula, you should train yourself. I will not tell a deliberate lie, even in jest. Claim Craving is a tension or tightness in the head, specifically the meninges. I was doing so much meditation, I almost constantly had tension and tightness in my head. And uh, I started thinking about that, and maybe this is the, the tension that what I should be relaxing on the end and mouth breath. So I relaxed the tension that was in my mind. And right after that, I noticed that my mind was clear, very observant, and there was no distracting thoughts. It was just clear mind. And I thought, wow, that's really something I'd never seen before. So I said, okay, let's try it again. So I did it again. And I kept doing it all the way back to my room. And I wound up sitting for about two hours. No, I didn't bring my brain with me. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds a little bit yeah. <laughs> Now, your, your brain has two sections like this. And around each section is a membrane. It's called the meninges. Every time you have a thought, every time a feeling arises, every time a sensation arises, the meninge contracts a little bit and causes tension and tightness. You need to be able to recognize that you have that tension and tightness in your head, in your brain, and relax that. Okay? When craving arises, any kind of thought, any kind of feeling, any kind of sensation that arises, it causes your brain to expand a little bit against that membrane, and it causes tension and tightness in your head, in your mind. If you go to people that are practicing meditation other than this, and you talk to them about the tension and tightness in your head, they won't even recognize that it's there. It has to be intentionally relaxed. What is craving? Craving always manifests as tension and tightness in your mind and in your body. Always. This distorted view of craving is central to Bhante Wilmramsi's teaching. The entire twim practice that he developed is built upon this basic error. Craving is a commonly used English translation of the Pali word tanha. Tanha literally means thirst or hunger. More generally, it refers to all craving. We can still see the same connotations expressed in modern English usages such as thirsty and thirst trap. In his 45-year teaching career, the Blessed One never once compared tanha to tension and tightness in the head. And yet, the Pali language is entirely capable of describing it that way. And we know this 
because there are descriptions of tension in the head found within the suttas in reference to painful symptoms resulting from disease or induced by wrong practices such as holding the breath. How did the Blessed One describe craving? Monks, any desire passion with regard to craving for forms is a defilement of the mind. Any desire passion with regard to craving for sounds, craving for aromas, craving for flavors, craving for tactile sensations, craving for ideas is a defilement of the mind. When, with regard to these six bases, the defilements of awareness are abandoned, then the mind is inclined to renunciation. The mind, fostered by renunciation, feels malleable for the direct knowing of these qualities worth realizing. So why is it that the Blessed One never related craving to tension and tightness in the head, if, as Bhante Wilmramsi expects us to believe, this is what he was really talking about? It is because craving is something far more general and subtle than this tension Bhante Wilmramsi was referring to. Even many of the Sutavedans have admitted that they did not experience this tension or tightness or take seriously his Menenji's theory, but they nevertheless played along with it rather than attempting to correct their teacher, who was obstinate on this point. What he described was idiosyncratic, meaning incidental, specific to him and others sharing his condition, and not, as he claimed, a universal phenomenon. Many people do not experience tension and tightness in the head at all, and these people nevertheless still exhibit craving. This is a danger of these false teachings. They lead one to believe that by eliminating this tension and tightness, one has eliminated craving. But this is not at all the case. We can see this in Bhante Wilmramsi's own behavior. It is an open secret that Bhante Wilmramsi was a long-time user of tobacco. Anyone who has ever quit or even attempted to quit an addictive substance such as nicotine or caffeine knows for themselves that the only reason a person uses such a substance is because of craving. And this is precisely the kind of craving that the Blessed One was speaking about. Only an uninstructed, run-of-the-mill person having no true understanding of the Dhamma would try to deny this fact. Here are some testimonies regarding Bhante Wilmramsi's tobacco use. Commonly, when meditators have these, it's taken as a sign that their practice is not strong enough. Have anxiety? You need to meditate longer and it'll go away. So what's an accomplished teacher to do when he or she has anxiety? What does that signal to students whose teachers tell them to meditate longer and longer. And what does that leave teachers like Bhante, to whom students seek for addictions, yet come late to Dhamma talks because he needs a smoke, while claiming becoming an anagami with no lust left in him? This contemplative met Bhante Wimramsi at Lee Brasington's Jhana Meditation Retreat in 2003, mentioned above. We had a number of conversations with Bhante V while he smoked cigarettes outside of his cottage in the evenings. During these conversations, we found that he had nothing kind to say about Lee Brasington. While we found we had to agree with many of Bhante V's criticisms, his method of criticism seemed rather ungracious considering he was a guest of Lee Brasington. Thus, to eat a host's food and then say nothing kind about him seemed disrespectful. He sometimes seems somewhat self-unaware in the answers he gives. Once, on our way to sports authority, he pulled out his Swisher sweets. I was like, Bonte, if you don't have any craving, then why are you smoking Swishers? He was like, I don't crave them. I can quit whenever I want. I just don't want to. Bonte, you silly goose. Later on that same car ride, I asked him what gets reborn if there's no soul to transmigrate. He just said, cryptically, the aggregates, then puffed his swisher. 
Another example of craving in Bhante Ramsey's behavior is his obsession with inserting his given name, Marvel, into his books, giving it bold emphasis. The driving factor behind this is craving and conceit, but he seemed to be totally unaware of this due to his redefinition of the word craving. Here he is explaining his fascination with his own name. It is marvelous. I always love it when that, that, that uh, marvelous comes into... Uh, <laughs> comes into the scripture because that's my actual name, Marvel. So it makes me happy every time I see it. So if this tension and tightness in the head isn't craving, then what is it? What is this phenomenon that Bhante Wilmaramsi interpreted as a contraction of the meninges or an expansion of the brain? So... You know, you talk to these dermatologists and they say that, you know, the scalp in men who are balding, 80% of these individuals have a very tight scalp and that they seem to suggest that that tension seems to arise mainly from this involuntary and chronic contraction of the scalp perimeter muscles that basically round the entire top part of the scalp and are anchored to this dense fibrous membrane that underlies balding prone regions called the glia apparatica. And so when these muscles clamp down involuntarily and chronically, they tend to pull the scalp tight. So if you look at disease states that also involve things of chronic pressure or chronic tension, or chronic muscular contraction, you tend to see the same patterns that we also see in a balding scalp. But then people might be wondering, like, what causes it to get so tight? Like... Do some people have really tight scalps and other people don't have tight scalps? And what's making it tight? It's a great question. I mean, I'm sure that some of this is genetically predetermined to a high degree in the womb and then in early childhood development, depending on the amount that we chew, the way that our jaw develops, that will influence the structure of our skull, um, the way that our sutures settle into early adulthood our androgen exposure overall. Again, the data suggests with this Botox stuff that 80% of individuals who have androgenic alopecia who are men tend to have these tighter scalps. Doing these injections themselves, they seem to improve hair counts overall for about 80% of individuals. When I talked to Dr. Frund about his initial investigation, he said that you could predict the top responder to Botox by just telling whether somebody had a tight scalp or not. So we can see that this feeling of tightness in the head is nothing but an idiosyncratic phenomenon, a medical condition, or a habit that some individuals have developed related to stress, similar to the biting of nails, the pulling of hairs, and so on. In the teaching of the noble ones, a distinction is made between Pacheka Sacha, or idiosyncratic truth, and Arya Sacha, noble truth. This teaching of Bhante Wilmaramsi's, which is his personal view or idiosyncratic truth, is dangerous and misleading. The practice of attempting to relax the brain or the meninges results in the gradual attrition of one's mindfulness and situational awareness, the end result being a dull mind with difficulty concentrating, poor comprehension of the written and spoken word, the hindrance of sloth and torpor, heightened suggestibility, and, ultimately, psychosis. This is the way of going to sleep, not the way to awakening. This leads to the increase of greed, hatred, and delusion. It does not lead to their decrease. Bhante Wilmaramsi was not the first to entertain this idea that relieving some perceived pressure inside the skull would result in awakening. This idea goes back many thousands of years and was expressed in the practice of trepanation, which is the chiseling or drilling of holes in the skull in order to expose the meninges and allow the brain to expand very slightly outside the confines of the skull. This misguided and dangerous practice has continued even into the modern era. Please, Joe, tell us what trepanning is. Well, trepanning is 
of making a hole in the skull, nothing else, just that. Yes, in the skull, in the, in the bone. In the bone, yeah. Now, why would you want to do that? Well, the reason is to increase the volume of blood in the brain. The volume of blood in the brain? Yeah. And what does that do? Well, it gives you more energy and a bit more consciousness. I did it in the middle of the night, and uh, that was a success. It was finished in half an hour. Only it took me four hours to get the blood off the walls, for I hadn't counted on the electric drill, making a fountain of blood that went on the ceiling. I hadn't counted on that. That was the one thing I hadn't counted on, but that happened. Bart Hugus was the first person who knowingly made a hole in his skull to restore the intracranial pulse pressure. I withdrew the drill, the newly restored pulsation blasted that blood that accumulated up there into a spout coming out of my forehead. And for a moment I freaked. I thought, oh no, I've, I've cut into an artery. And um, it was a, a very strange moment. Uh, I had completed the operation, I was elated from that, but then I had a horror uh, reaction there for a moment. And then I heard gurgling in my skull as the new equilibrium of brain blood volume and brain water adjusted itself. I studied medicine in order to become a scientific discoverer, and that's what I am. And I wanted in the first place to discover how to cure psychosis. And I found it can be cured by skull trepanation. Then I found more. I found skull trepanation gets you high. There is also Ketri Mudra, a tantric yogic practice which involves severing the frenulum of one's tongue and stretching it so that it can be inserted into the nasopharynx and used to exert pressure with the aim of eventually breaking open the suture between the frontal and ethmoid bones and allowing a liquid substance called amrita to flow out and be consumed. If Delson Armstrong is telling the truth when he claims to have mastered these various systems of yoga, then this is one of the practices he must have undertaken. To be perfectly clear on this point, none of this has anything whatsoever to do with the teaching of the Noble Ones. The Blessed One never gave any such instructions, and such instructions do not lead the one who practices them to the total end of suffering. Claim. Crystals should be involved in right samadhi. Crystals hold energy too. They hold memory. <laughs> During meditation. Because, uh, well, they hold memory. So you have a good meditation if you're holding a crystal. The, the vibration of that good meditation will be remembered in the crystal. So you hold it again. And your mind calms down real fast, much faster. You can do that or not. I tend to like to sit holding crystals. I feels good in my hands. But then if you give them away to somebody that's sensitive, they can get it really fast. I think you hand it to them and they said that they can feel it sometimes really fast. Aren't you doing a nice thing for yourself when you radiate mm -hmm. loving kindness? Mm -hmm. And that's why this is healing. Yes? I was told about a study. I, I didn't read it myself, so I can't cite anything. But they were talking about taking jar, two jars of water, labeling one love mm -hmm. and one hate. Oh, and yeah. they would see on a microscope how different yeah. the molecules would look. Only the source was the same. Yeah. And they even did it in different languages, not just English, but right. all languages, love, hate. And, and I just thought that was kind of pertinent. Yeah, and then he froze them. And then he froze them and took pictures of the um, crystals, the ice crystals. And then he made a deck of cards and everything with it, with all the different feelings for the different crystals. Mm -hmm. For like love and just this kind of love, that kind of love. love. Where's the source of this information? It's a Japanese it's author, I can't remember his name. Can you remember it, Jitra? Yeah, I think it's that Japanese. Moto. 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 Something Moto, yeah. Turkey buzzards like uh, negative electromagnetic energy. Oh, okay. Okay? And if you want them to go away, but you don't want to harm them, you get some scrap metal, shredded scrap metal, and you put them in a, a container. You take a piece of crystal and put it in it, and then get some boot resin and fill it up to the top. 
Okay. Let that dry and then put it close to the, the nest and it will make them feel unpleasant. It changes a negative energy into positive energy. doesn't harm them at all. Right. But it, they they will just go someplace else. Okay. Yeah, we'll try that. That's great. It's called okay. Organite. Okay. If you want to find out more about Organite, uh, you can do it on the website, on the different okay. websites that, on Organite. Okay, we should look for that. <laughs> this is but a mote of dust lodged in the eye of the unawakened being, preventing them from seeing things as they have come to be and untangling the tangle. It has no place in the teaching of the Noble Ones. We had crystals, jewels, and gemstones called Mani in the Pali language. 2,600 years ago. We regarded them as beautiful, precious, rare, and valuable objects, adornments for kings, princes, wealthy merchants, and their wives, objects of no use to those gone forth, living the holy life, having forsaken the use of money and the amassing of acquisitions. This is what the Blessed One had to say about precious metals and gems. Gold and money are not proper for Sakyan ascetics. They neither accept nor receive gold and money. They have set aside gems and gold and rejected gold and money. If gold and money were proper for them, then the five kinds of sensual stimulation would also be proper. And if the five kinds of sensual stimulation are proper for them, you should definitely regard them as not having the qualities of an ascetic or follower of the Sakyan. From this video, we learned that Bhante Wilmaramsi believed that crystals were an integral and necessary part of his own meditation practice. That when he meditated, he did so holding a large crystal in each hand. Bhante Wilmaramsi also referred to organite. Organite is a composite material comprising pieces of metal embedded in epoxy resin. Created by Carl Hans Wells in 1991, inspired by the theories of Wilhelm Reich. Reich, in the 1930s, theorized about something he called orgone energy. He chose the name orgone because he believed that this energy was related to sexual potency and hence the orgasm. Reich was a hugely influential character in the sexual revolution and New Age movements of the 1960s. He built devices called orgone accumulators that he claimed would concentrate this orgone energy and increase the libido of patients who sat inside the device. Naturally, sex cults grew out of this experimentation. Reich made many other wild claims as well, such as being able to control the weather with gun-like devices which he called cloudbusters. But one claim would be his downfall. He claimed that his orgone accumulator could cure cancer. The FDA did not look kindly on that. Bante Wilmaramsi was clearly influenced by Wilhelm Reich, the Theosophists, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, and the New Age movement as a whole. He regurgitated these views. He presented them as if they had something to do with the truth, as if they had come down through his Taravadan lineage. Another view was expressed by Sister Kema in the background of that video. She suggested that meditative experiences could be transmitted from one person to another by means of crystals. This shows a profound lack of insight into the Dhamma. No person, and certainly no inanimate object can directly transmit awakening to another. The only means of transmission is via the skilled use of language, what the Blessed One called the miracle of instruction. And what is the miracle of instruction? There is the case where a certain person gives instruction in this way. Direct your thought in this way. Don't direct it in that. Attend to things in this way. Don't attend to them in that. Let go of this. Enter and remain in that. This is called the miracle of instruction. 
It is clear from these statements that Bante Wemaramsi and Sister Kema were still clinging to rites and rituals as playing some role in awakening, specifically rituals involving crystals. This means that they were not Sotapanna or stream enterers, not counted among noble persons, for the fetter of clinging to rites and rituals is broken at stream entry. Because they were not Sotapanna, they had not eliminated the possibility of being reborn in the animal womb, the realm of the hungry ghosts, or even hell. Claim, Twim doesn't lead one who practices it into psychosis. So the best thing to happen was to have him step down because of the two realities he decided to live in. Because we don't think we could keep up with the questions we could get from everybody if he was giving a talk. And we had him do several talks that we didn't release that were about this other reality. And his other reality isn't bad either. I just want to tell you that. You know, I've seen people grow old with this kind of thing before happening, and it can be very scary for them, very scary for the people that are listening to the person who is old and this is happening to them, okay? But this is not that kind of reality. His reality is he had a glimpse of something. He had a glimpse like you would have an experience and an opening. He had a glimpse of sort of a par not a parallel reality, but sort of a, a surreal reality that he could slip into and slip out of where we are and go back in and go out. That's the problem. You can't keep him in our reality long enough to say, to reason with him, to just get in the ambulance and go to the doctor. That's the fact. So it's very, very difficult to know what to do. In his surreal reality, his new his new job for the next 10 years it's eight or 10 years but he he won't it's complicated he he'll say i'm i'm not going to be here very long but when i go into this reality permanently i'm going to feed the entire world and all the other worlds that have living beings on them everyone's going to be fed in this universe and other universes now that's not a bad idea when you look at that type of a surreal reality that is reflecting uh to me i've known him for the last 22 years and some of the people that are his friends from way back another probably almost 20 more years they lived through the 60s and 70s and we many of us really wanted to be able to feed the world we wanted mankind these were our dreams in high school coming out in 66 67 that those that period where vietnam was happening why isn't the world settling down why can't it feed the world how's the world give it medicine and this is a dilemma for mankind that's been here i think forever honestly i do and some people will say even go as far as to say there might be something wrong with our dna that we wouldn't do that uh, see bande is uh, stable huh? he's stable but uh, there are certain uh, things where he kind of a little bit gets confused uh, so he may be uh, uh, thinking about certain things and he may get kind of get confused at uh, uh, and uh, he's staying in his kuti and david is taking care of him uh, well uh, so he visits him uh, every day and then there is one uh, lady also uh, who is staying full time in the center they uh, get him food so he eats a specific food now like he eats smoothies so they give him a big glass of smoothie and put uh, uh, whatever uh, protein and uh, uh, berries and whatever they can put in that uh, so uh, so he is being fed well uh, he has lost some weight but he is overall uh, okay and when he is speaking to somebody who comes like uh, uh, sister Kema was uh, explaining uh, they, he can be kind of uh, clear in his uh, communication uh, but uh, certain times he kind of uh, uh, has uh, thoughts or something like that which uh, can be a uh, little bit uh, off uh, the uh, topic so that is the only thing other than that he is kind of uh, stable now. 
and uh, uh, as far as uh, going to the doctor is uh, because of the long term effects of whatever may have happened to bande like if there was a stroke uh, which a sister kema kind of suspects if that is there what is the long term effect so those kind of effects we can avoid if he is willing to go to the hospital and get uh, mri uh, scans and uh, those things uh, which can be done uh, because uh, when he was in malaysia uh, two years back uh, two years or three years back i think so uh, we did have an mri scan for uh, because he was feeling some uh, feeling some pain over here in the top part Uh, so then uh, the doctor uh, uh, came uh, and uh, said that uh, your mri is are clear and there is nothing uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, which would not uh, kind of be in line with your age okay uh, so there is a little bit of brain shrinkage but that is time so he said that is expected and uh, other than that there is nothing wrong with him that was 3 years back and uh, currently uh, we wanted to kind of get him tested but uh, he kind of refuses to go uh, for any test uh, because more or less he kind of believes in alternative uh, therapies and uh, he he was working with uh, energy uh, and uh, natural healing when he was in hawaii not uh, when he was not a monk so he worked with uh, uh, natural healing and uh, reiki and uh, 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 like energy healing uh, techniques and all those things uh, for a long time so he does not believe in uh, kind of a lot uh, in the modern med- medical system so that can also be a reason why he kind of refuses that could be just that he may be kind of sensing uh, through his own energy that what is happening is uh, in line with that or he may be kind of thinking that he is able to kind of figure out what is happening and uh, that is the reason he does not want to visit but other than that uh, i think he he is uh, steady and uh, stable and uh, uh, david is taking care of uh, him and we will update if there is a, something major happens we will update david has promised that he will <coughs> update and uh, that's the reason he put that uh, and the io group also groups io and there was unanswered possibilities of how the sudden mental psychosis set off this whole episode which has made things very difficult for david or myself to help bonte work well with medical personnel at this time it was no use for me to attempt to communicate with him when the episode began he was suffering from being caught in two realities The real one when you begin talking to him and the pseudo reality that comes and breaks in and can't stop the flow of thoughts, reason, and two-way conversation. None of us could connect. The clots were caused originally from being told to sit on the floor for long hours that kept being increased along with equivalent resulting sleep deprivation. The main issue for him now is for anyone to figure out how to stop the constant flow of thoughts and fast moving mind moments popping up which so fast they truly are mind bending for him. He is not in his right mind so far. And communication and cooperation for treatment is very difficult and these time are both exhausting for medical personnel as well as exhausting for himself. Bante Wilmaramsi and his disciples misled many people into doing practices that lead to psychosis. We've already spoken about how they responded to these bad outcomes by lying and covering it up, by refusing to help those whom they had caused grave injury, by doubling down and putting other people at risk. And in the end, Bonte Wormsi himself would succumb to the same psychosis that he had inflicted on so many others. Anyone aware of these events who is still making the claim that Twim is harmless clearly has no integrity and is committed to evil. Claim Twim doesn't withhold any secret teachings. There are no secret techniques held back, just the words from the suttas and commentary by Venerable Bonte Vimalaramsi. You're staying with the loving kindness and that starts to change on its own this is a natural process now it changes 
I'm not going to tell you how it changes because those are the questions that I have to find out from you. The feeling in your heart will just move by itself. Some, some people say it moves up to here, some people say it's up here, sometimes it's over to the side. It doesn't matter. When it moves up into your head, now you're going to be able to have more and more equanimity and tranquility. For longer periods of time, you're going to be able to sit with staying with your object of meditation without distraction. A lot of people use the word compassion and they get it mixed up with loving kindness, which is a little bit different. Again, I won't tell you what the difference is because people have to tell me. So I know that you're in that state. While David Johnson was claiming in his book that TWIM has no secret teachings, Bhante Wilmaramsi was clearly withholding information from students in a misguided attempt to diagnose their progress. This precisely fits the definition of a secret teaching, which is a teaching revealed only to the initiated. This is also critical information. The fact that the TWIM definition of compassion is wildly different from the meaning used in the teaching of the Noble Ones is something that any person evaluating TWIM for its legitimacy would benefit from knowing. This pervasive alteration of the definitions of words is a subtle form of secrecy and deception used in order to mislead students into thinking that what they are following is the teaching of the Noble Ones when in fact it is something else entirely. Claim Mara has no gender, is neither man nor woman. I learned an interesting thing about Mara. We always call him he, but that's just so you understand who we're talking about. It, it was asexual. He didn't have any sex at all. So, and he, he was very much attached to sensual pleasures and thought everybody should have these sensual pleasures. And uh, eat, drink, and be merry for the rest of your life that comes from Mara. In the Pali Canon, Mara, who is the personification of death, is always depicted as a male deva. The idea of being asexual is totally at odds with Mara's characteristic devotion to sensuality and the perpetuation of samsara, the place of wandering. Here are some words about Mara from the Blessed One, which directly contradict the claim that Bhante Wimal Ramsi has just made. They understand it's impossible for a woman to perform the role of Saka, Mara, or Brahma, but it is possible for a man to perform the role of Saka, Mara, or Brahma. Then, Mara's daughters, Tanha, Arati, and Raga, approached Mara, the evil one, and addressed him in verse. Why are you despondent, father? Who's the man for whom you grieve? We'll catch him with the snare of lust as they catch the forest elephant. We'll bind him tightly and bring him back, and he'll be under your control. Seeing as Mara's daughters addressed him as father, clearly Mara is a man. Why then? Did Bhante Wimaramsi feel so compelled to misrepresent and contradict the Blessed One? If he really knew Mara, he would have known the answer to that question. Claim An Arahant maintains awareness during sleep. I'd like to ask you a bit about sleep. Sleep. Yeah. Now, David Johnson, uh, who... Uh, viewers of the last episode or listeners of the last episode will recall introduced us mentioned that you don't sleep much actually yeah. and uh i'm curious then what is your experience of sleep and how has it changed um, and in particular has sleep has the awakening of various insight stages uh, stream entry and beyond affected your experience of sleep yeah that's that's uh it's an interesting experience now because the way i envision sleep or i look at sleep now is just a, pr a physical process so when we talk about the various stages of sleep, um, I'm able to just be conscious of them. So I know that, for example, the mind is now getting into, uh, you know, an REM phase. 
or it's getting into a deep sleep phase. And so there is a level of mindfulness now in this mind, which is able to be, let's say, alert or awake, even while asleep. So the purpose of sleep in this case I, I look at is just rest for the body and uh, certain regenerative processes that the body has to go through at the level of the cells. But on the mental level, or let's say on the subjective experiential level, I'm still aware of being awake while, let's say, in deep sleep as well. And the way I look at it is, it is, it is a fulfillment of the understanding in the one of the Upanishads. It's either the Manduka or Mandukya. I always get confused by it because they're so similar sounding. But it's an interesting one because it talks about the secret of the syllable Om. You know, and what it says is you have the three syllables that make up Om. You have A, U, and Ma. And what these represent really are the waking state, the dream state, and the dreamless deep sleep state. But it talks about a fourth stage, which is called Chaturya, which is shortened to the Turya stage. And that is the silence uh, beyond the Om, which is aware of these different states within the experience of Om. So the way I would equate that is an experience of Turya, being, let's say, always on, uh, you know, never really sleeping. And this was also found, as we talked about a little bit about the research last time, which was when I was in that sleep uh, cycle, they didn't see indications within the brainwave reading showing that the mind had actually gone to sleep or the brain had gone to sleep where it was unconscious. There was still a level of mindfulness. And so that's why one of the researchers, when they came in, they actually asked, were you actually asleep? Because we couldn't see uh, what was going on. It, it seemed like you were still awake. There was still some alertness uh, through that 90 minute cycle. And why is it that this transformation of sleep, which sounds, you know, if, we compare, if I compare it to myself, for example, you know, um, I have very conventional sleep. Often I don't remember my dreams, in fact, despite attempting to occasionally. So I, I think I'm pretty baseline. Why would that change of consciousness compared to, say, a baseline uh, person um, mean you could sleep less? Uh, in fact, how much do you sleep on average or how much do you think you'd need if you had to you know, guess? And how much do you sleep and, and why, why is this change meant that you can sleep less than, say, a baseline person? Right. Well, I'll say one thing. Um, there have been occasions, or more than, let's say, occasionally, where I've been able to go without sleep for two or three days and still be okay, uh, still be functional. And, uh, you know, one time, um, as I was explaining to you, when I first met Bhante Vimal uh in San Francisco, or close to San Francisco, uh, they had invited me to come and see him. Um, and so at that time, I was still working uh, in San Diego, and I wasn't I wasn't asleep for about two days. I took a short nap, and then did a little meditation, and then went on the plane to go and see them. So I hadn't had much sleep at that time. But uh, if you were to ask them, there was just you know continuous joy and you know togetherness in terms of the mind and collectedness and good energy. So on average, I'd say I do have uh, about six or seven hours of sleep. But again, the quality of sleep for me is different in the sense of uh, at least my subjective experience is that I'm still awake during those six to seven hours in, this, in, in so far as being in this meditative awareness. And I, I rarely ever dream. Um, the way I explain the way I experience REM and the dream state and the deep sleep state is basically how you would experience neither perception nor non-perception uh, where certain things are happening, but it's like the sankharas the samskaras are there, present, and you can notice them. And then the deep sleep state is where it's like a level of nothingness. It's a complete blank, but there is still consciousness there. There's still awareness of that nothingness. I think when it comes to, you know, things like dream yoga and things, I think, you know, I probably did that on an, un, let's say, unconscious level or kind of stumbled into it in the beginning while I went to the Himalayas. So I, I believe the precognition that I experienced happened as a result of what I dreamed or, you know, whatever I was seeing in the night happen in the day. So certain elements, certain people that I saw, certain places that we went to, certain experiences we had, was all there in the dream. And one was lucid of that. And then when that experience happened, recollecting what that was. So it's sort of like a deja vu, if you will, but to a point where you're, you're, you're completely lucid of this experience. And obviously, as I just had indicated some time back, that you can actually know what the person's going to say and then be able to complete their sentences and so on. So I think I stumble into that experience, but I consciously haven't done any kind of experiences with uh, dream yoga uh, to that extent. I have done a little bit of lucid dreaming here and there before, a long time back, but uh, not to this extent. 
Sleep deprivation is a major theme with Delson. Notice that he makes use of yogic references and terminology to explain his views on sleep. That is because these views are yogic views. They do not reflect the teaching of the Noble Ones. Delson's experiences with sleep are due to his interest in and practice of yoga and have nothing whatsoever to do with the Noble Eightfold Path taught by the Blessed One. And yet, while claiming to be an Arahant, he presents this information as if it is a necessary part of the process of awakening. This perversion of the truth occurred a long time ago, near the inception of the yogic teachings. It stems from a misunderstanding of the term Bodhi, or awakening. This awakening that the Blessed One made reference to is related to sleep only by way of analogy. The genuine Arahants, when they slept, slept well, slept soundly, slept deeply, slept peacefully, and there are several references to this in the suttas and monastic code. On one occasion, the Blessed One was staying near Alavi, on a spread of leaves by a cattle track in a Simsapa forest. Then, Hattaka of Alavi, out roaming and rambling for exercise, saw the Blessed One sitting on a spread of leaves by the cattle track in the Simsapa forest. On seeing him, he went to him, and on arrival, having bowed down to him, sat to one side. As he was sitting there, he said to the Blessed One, Lord, I hope the Blessed One has slept in ease. Yes, young man, I have slept in ease. Of those in the world who sleep in ease, I am one. Just think of how soundly you would sleep if the sources of all your problems, all your fears, were utterly destroyed. Delson takes pride in sleeping while he should be awake and remaining awake when he should be sleeping. In the teaching of the Noble Ones, this is classified as abiding in delusion. Claim. Sleep restriction is necessary for progress. And when you practice, you start having these emotional swings. Like it. I don't like it. I like it. I don't like it. This is one of the reasons why you have to have so much sleep during the day. During the night is the case. I have down eight hours or else I'm not worth anything. Why? Because I spend my whole day liking and disliking, liking and disliking. As you keep on this path and you smile into things and you start to have fun with things, you will naturally need less sleep. You may sleep less and wake up often at night. If you do wake up, then you can try doing a sitting for as long as you can, and then go back to sleep when you get tired. Around this time some meditators on retreat may want to get up earlier, like 2 to 3 a.m., and sit longer in the morning. The teacher will encourage you to sit longer. Uh, the, it was uh, over, split about over two days, two different days, and it was through, uh, through two different labs. So the first lab was looking at how uh, the mind starts to build what they, know, they, they call predictive modeling. So what they're trying to figure out is does the brain recognize things in the way of sounds, or does it recognize things in the way of speech? So does it recognize words, or does it recognize that this is a made-up word, and things like that? So that was the first experiment, and what they did was, yes, they hooked me up to 64 electrodes. They also were testing my temperature, uh, my heart rate, uh, respiratory rate, and any kind of uh, subtle movements and, and things like that. And what they found was uh, very interesting, which is, they, they did different kind of uh, measurements for different levels of the states. So one was a waking state, just neutral, nothing going on. One was a focused attention, and then one was just that state of cessation. And what they saw was uh, the brain actually had more delta activity uh, while it was in this uh, state of awakeness. And then as well as in the same as niroda or, or cessation, as we say. And what they saw was the, the, the delta waves were so deep, they were deeper than deep sleep. In cessation, you're, so you're going along and then 
this cessation happens and then there's these long delta waves. Very long, yeah, very long amplitude delta waves, which are even deeper than deep sleep, mm. uh, as, as we understand it from neuroscience. Right, so, my, so let's say, I mean, delta is roughly 0.5 to, I think, 4 hertz. And this might have been closer to the 0.5 range of that. Right, or even lower. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, well, the, the initial findings from the scientists was that uh, they were kind of surprised to see that because first they thought maybe it was the brain was just basically asleep. But they saw that the other mental, or rather the other physical or physio physiological components of the body were like as if it was still awake. Uh, so the heart rate and the respiratory mm -hmm. rate and things like that were like as if they were still awake, but then the mind was completely shut off. It's comforting to know that your brain stem is still keeping your body alive. Yeah, yeah, and that's what we <laughs> would call in Buddhism as vital formations or the ayu sankaras, which keep the metabolism going, which keep the cellular activity in a healthy way. Um, the other thing that the, they said was, uh, why, so that was the first study, and then the second study was in a sleep lab. So they had me go into a 90-minute cycle of sleep, and what they were kind of confounded by was that it looked like the mind was still awake, uh, and so they asked me, were you actually asleep or not? But then they saw that the physiological aspects of the body were like it was in a state of sleep, a state of deep sleep, but the mind looked like it was awake. And that's your subjective experience? You were aware while the body was going through a sleep stage? Yes, so the mind was aware of the different stages of sleep. Uh, and there was this very sharp mindfulness, as we'll say. Because of that, uh, they were kind of kind of confused by that because there was more delta activity while the mind doing its own thing. Uh, practically no delta activity while it was asleep and then very deep delta activity mm. while it was in cessation. I don't care who it is. When you follow the directions precisely, exactly, you will be able to attain Nibbana. Okay. We get up at 5 o'clock in the morning. We are here at 5.30. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> we stay in the meditation hall until 10 o'clock. Not 9.30. Not quarter after nine, stay in the meditation hall until 10 o'clock, and then you can go back to your, your cooties if you're tired. Now you can sit in, in, your, uh, in your room if you want. Don't go to bed before 10 o'clock. Don't be lazy. <laughs> Everybody here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you get seven hours of sleep, you go to bed at 10 o'clock, you get up at five, that's seven hours right there. Now, this meditation is going to be a little bit different than what you may have been doing in the past. Uh, please follow these instructions precisely, exactly. And your progress is going to be amazingly good. For the students who are ardent, diligent, and energetic, the results of following the Sutuaden's instructions has certainly not been good. In fact, the more precisely one attempts to follow the rather imprecise twim instructions, the worse the result becomes. The Sutuaden's do not publicly admit that they advocate sleep deprivation and in fact have denied it. On occasion, they have even said publicly that students should take as much sleep as they need. But this appears to be only a tactic used to create plausible deniability. The truth is that they pressure their students to sleep less and less and not for the students' benefit. They constantly reiterate that progress in the meditation will only occur if one follows their instructions precisely. And yet, when asked to clarify the instructions, what their purpose is, and so on, they refuse to do so. Delson Armstrong, in particular, boasts at every opportunity given to him about how little sleep he needs and the feats of sleep deprivation he has undertaken, also implying that this was instrumental in his supposed attainment 
of arahantship. When asked why they insist on sleep deprivation in their students, the Sutoedans refuse to answer. We have identified several reasons why they consider sleep deprivation to be beneficial for furthering their interests, even though it harms their students. But first, let's discuss what the Blessed One had to say about sleep. Many have taken these statements out of context and thus interpreted them wrongly. The missing context is that he spoke these words 2,600 years ago in northern India to homeless wanderers, often living outdoors without artificial light, without campfires or candles, surrounded by biting insects and dangerous animals. In such circumstances, there is a strong tendency to sleep excessively due to the prolonged darkness and as a means of temporarily escaping these harsh conditions. Meditating at night and sleeping during the day was a practical matter. At night it was cool and quiet, and certain pests were dormant. This sometimes made it the ideal time for meditation. But there is a difference between shifting one's sleep schedule to suit the environment and engaging in consistent sleep deprivation. Furthermore, India is a hot country, and in hot countries, people historically allotted a significant portion of their sleep to the hottest part of the day after the midday meal, and we see evidence for this practice in the suttas and the vinaya. Sleeping itself is not a fruitful practice in terms of liberation. Nobody has ever been liberated by sleep, so the Blessed One sometimes encouraged his homeless, non-working monastic disciples to refrain from sleeping more than they required in order to remain in good physical and mental health. There is an enormous difference between a healthy monk who performs no labor, has limited responsibilities and few enemies, having the occasional all-night meditation session, and a modern layperson who performs intense labor, has crushing responsibilities, and numerous enemies doing the same on a consistent daily basis. Getting less sleep than one requires is extremely deleterious to one's physical and mental health. The consequences accrue rapidly and range in severity from impaired judgment all the way up to sudden death or worse. Let's see what the medical literature has to say about sleep restriction. Improving sleep quality leads to better mental health, a meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials. One way to test the causal link is to evaluate the extent to which interventions that improve sleep quality also improve mental health. We conducted a meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials that reported the effects of an intervention that improved sleep on composite mental health, as well as on seven specific mental health difficulties. Improving sleep led to a significant, medium-sized effect on composite mental health, depression, anxiety, and rumination, as well as significant, small to medium-sized effects on stress, and finally, small significant effects on positive psychosis symptoms. We also found a dose-response relationship in that greater improvements in sleep quality led to greater improvements in mental health. Our findings suggest that sleep is causally related to the experience of mental health difficulties. Centers for Disease Control – Effect of Inadequate Sleep on Frequent Mental Distress 13% of study participants experienced inadequate sleep and 14.1% experienced frequent mental distress. Participants who averaged 6 hours or less of sleep per night were about 2.5 times more likely to have frequent mental distress when controlling for confounders than those who slept more than 6 hours. Inadequate sleep was associated with significantly increased odds of frequent mental distress. Our findings suggest that further research is necessary 
to evaluate the temporal relationship between inadequate sleep and frequent mental distress. Severe sleep deprivation causes hallucinations and a gradual progression towards psychosis with increasing time awake. Psychotic symptoms develop with increasing time awake from simple visual somatosensory misperceptions to hallucinations and delusions, ending in a condition resembling acute psychosis. These experiences are likely to resolve after a period of sleep, although more information is required to identify factors which can contribute to the prevention of persistent symptoms. Neurocognitive Consequences of Sleep Deprivation Sleep deprivation, whether the result of clinical disorder or lifestyle choices, and whether acute or chronic, poses significant cognitive risks in the performance of many ordinary tasks, such as driving and operating machinery. Recent experiments reveal that following chronic sleep restriction, significant daytime cognitive dysfunction accumulates to levels comparable to that found after severe acute total sleep deprivation. Executive performance functions subserved by the prefrontal cortex in concert with the anterior cingulate and posterior parietal systems seem particularly vulnerable to sleep loss. The increased propensity for sleep to occur quickly, even when being resisted by a sleep-deprived subject, is consistent with evidence suggesting that micro-sleeps intrude into wakefulness when sleep-deprived subjects fail to respond, i.e. lapse, during cognitive performance demands. Both acute total sleep deprivation and chronic partial sleep deprivation can produce a high rate of lapsing that ultimately progresses to full and sustained sleep onset during goal-directed behavior, for example, motor vehicle operation. Remember this point about microsleeps. Sleep loss leads to the withdrawal of human helping across individuals, groups, and large-scale societies. Taken together, findings across all three studies establish inefficient sleep, both quantity and quality, as a degrading force influencing whether or not humans wish to help each other and do indeed choose to help each other through real-world altruistic acts observable at three different societal scales within individuals, across individuals, and at a nationwide level. Study 1 established not only the causal impact of sleep loss on the basic desire to help another human being, but further characterized the central underlying brain mechanism associated with this altered phenotype of diminished helping. A very interesting finding that perfectly lines up with the Sutawaden's redefinition of compassion as something other than being opposed to harmfulness and prone to helpfulness. Here are some of the symptoms of sleep restriction. Slowed thinking, reduced attention span, worsened memory, poor or risky decision-making, increased suggestibility, lack of energy, incidents of micro-sleep, that is, clicking out, mood changes, including feelings of stress, anxiety, or irritability. There is a large overlap between the symptoms of sleep restriction and the experiences of TWIM meditators. Here are some words from Dr. Caroline Van Damme on sleep deprivation and psychosis in the context of meditation practice. And if we suddenly start to do intensive uh, meditation and having some sleep deprivation with that, then we can have a full-blown uh, psychosis. And, and of course, not everyone will have it, but... And, and then it is said, well, those people are the ones who didn't do it well enough. I think those are the people who did it the best. <laughs> they, they followed the best advice and then they, they got psychotic and so they shouldn't be criti criticized by that. So it's, it's like, it, and it's true, sleep deprivation, sensory deprivation is a risk factor for psychosis and we all become psychotic if we 
completely um, get uh, sensory deprived, at one point we will all be psychotic. They have done some experiments like that in the past. This is what we have observed as well. It is the most diligent students who suffer the worst outcomes, simply because they follow the instructions precisely. When they are told that sleep restriction will lead to good results, they trust that and do as they are told, without lying to themselves or their teacher about it. So why do the Sutuedans rely on sleep restriction? As we learned from the medical literature, chronic sleep restriction has the same deleterious effects as acute sleep deprivation. The first thing to go is one's mindfulness and situational awareness. The next thing to go is one's heedfulness and sound judgment. It should be noted that the Blessed One's instructions focused on increasing these qualities, not decreasing them. But the Sutuedans do the opposite, because by this means, a student's suggestibility is increased. They enter a state very similar to hypnosis. They may begin to hallucinate. When in this state, it is easy to convince them that they've had some spiritual attainment. In fact, it is easy to convince them of just about anything. One twim student became convinced that he was a hamster. The Sutuedans know about these bad outcomes, but continue to insist on sleep restriction. They are unable to explain why they do so. What is the purpose? Surely, if one is going to put students in such extreme danger, it must be for some good reason. The reason is that their method simply does not work without it. Without the sleep restriction, the attainments don't come. And the attainments don't come because they are false attainments. They are hallucinations or post-hypnotic suggestions. Anyone who restricts their sleep long enough will experience this, and it can be deadly. Recall that Delson Armstrong spent the six years of his life prior to joining the Sutuadans studying under the hypnotist Greg Halpern. This was the perfect training program to become the leader of the Sutuadans, but it is not at all beneficial for one seeking true awakening. The TWIM method is extremely similar to the lucid dreaming technique known as wild or wake-induced lucid dreaming. Just like TWIM, wild requires sleep restriction in order to work. Just like TWIM, wild relies on progressive relaxation. Remember the micro-sleeps mentioned in the study? These are critically important to the Sutuadans. We'll cover why in more detail in the next section. But first, let's see what the Blessed One had to say about sleep. And further, an enemy wishes of an enemy. Oh, may this person sleep badly. Why is that? An enemy is not pleased with an enemy's restful sleep. When the body is tired, the mind is disturbed, and a disturbed mind is far from concentration. He always sleeps well, the Brahman who has attained Nibbana, cooled off, without acquisitions, not tainted by sensual pleasures, having cut off all attachments, having removed anguish in the heart. The peaceful one sleeps well, having attained peace of mind. At one time, the Buddha was staying near Rajagaha in the bamboo grove, the squirrel's feeding ground. He spent much of the night walking mindfully in the open. At the crack of dawn, he washed his feet and entered his dwelling. He laid down in the lion's posture on the right side, placing one foot on top of the other, mindful and aware and focused on the time of getting up. Then, Mara, the wicked, went up to the Buddha and addressed him in verse. What, you're asleep? Really, you're asleep? You sleep like a loser. What's up with that? You sleep thinking that the hut is empty. You sleep when the sun has come up. What's up with that? 
For them, there is no craving, the weaver, the clinger, to track them anywhere. With the ending of all attachments, the awakened Buddha sleeps. What's that got to do with you, Mara? Then Mara vanished right there. So it seems that the Suthawedans have sided with Mara on this matter, rather than the noble ones. Indeed, an enemy hates to see an enemy sleep well. Claim. The twim cessation is really cessation. And about half of the people that came to do their retreats were attaining at least Sotapanna, attain Nibbana in a 10-day retreat. And this hasn't happened a few times. This has happened a lot. And I have students that uh, go even deeper than being uh, at the first stage of awakening, Sotapanna. They go through the fruition, the fruition of Saktagami, fruition of Hanagami. So the very first time, I had no idea what I was doing. Like, I kind of stumbled into uh, the first attainment, if you will. And, and what that means is I was going through the level of nothingness, which is the seventh uh, jhana. It's, it's a level of nothingness and there's deep equanimity. And the mind was just observing mind at that point in time. And then suddenly it all just switched off. I was not even aware that it switched off until it came back on. So it's like the mind went for like a nap or just blacked out or whatever it happened. And I, and the first thing I remember the mind going was like, what just happened? And in that process of looking at it, what I saw was these little tiny flickers, these tiny little lights or figures or circular things. And what, what those were, were the first samskaras, the first formations that were arising and creating the process of the rest of the links of dependent origination to arise. And I noticed immediately that I felt this amazing joy and this amazing relief that, that was there. And the way David explained it to me was, well, okay, you experienced all of that. And he said, okay. And he said, I think you went for a little swim, which is his way of saying that, you know, you had stream entry, you entered the stream, if you will. And I didn't make anything of it. But what I did remember was when I came out of it, the world was hyper real. Like the colors were sharper, sounds were louder, um, food tasted be better, smells were sharper, the senses were just, you know, hyper aware. It was like I was living in some kind of 4D or five dimensional reality, just floating around. And, and the cessation of perception and feeling. Just like somebody flipped the lights off. There is no perception, there is no feeling, there is no consciousness at that time. And this is not Nibbana, this is still mundane Nibbana. This is not the super mundane Nibbana yet. When you come out of this state, you will see the links of dependent origination arising and passing away very quickly. And your understanding of that process is so deep and so profound that you get into an unconditioned state because you've let go of all conditioned, all conditions. Uh, that means letting go of all of the conditioned states of the links of dependent origination. When you let go of those, then you get into an unconditioned state. You'll be in that for a period of time. When you come out, you will feel a very, very strong sense of relief and you will feel happy whether you want to be or not. <laughs> and you'll be, you'll, you'll have that sense of release last, lasting for a few days. So what happened? You've become a Sotapanna. Now I want everybody to understand that I want you sitting no less, and this is sitting, not just sitting and walking, just sitting more, no less than six hours a day, which is not a lot. And when you can sit longer, I want you to sit longer. I was in a regiment when I was in Burma, where I had to I had to sit for one hour and walk for one hour, and I was doing that 18 hours a day. Try that sometime. It's not much fun. You are only concerned with mind now. You should sit for long periods of time. Sit one hour, two hours, and even three and four hours. The longer you sit, the more time mind has to calm down. So far, the record for Bonte students is two days in one sitting, completed by a man in Indonesia, and recently a man in the USA. And that really paid off, the results were phenomenal. And he just got up and walked away with no pain or stiffness, he felt just fine. Sit for one to three hours at least. Sometimes you will get bored. Six are that and come back to being peaceful. Sometimes the mind will wander in a thought, 
so just observe and release your attention and don't react to that. Let it be. Gradually the mind will not wander into thought at all for up to 10 to 15 minutes. Now you are doing well. Sometimes there is not a thought for 30 minutes or even an hour. Great, stay with this quiet mind and it will get deeper and deeper. I went to Burma to one particular teacher and the first day I went to the interview he said, how long did you sit? And I said, I sat for an hour, I walked for an hour, that's standard. And he said, why don't you sit longer? And I said, okay. Came back in, how long did you sit? Sat for two hours, walked for an hour. Good, why don't you sit longer? <laughs> okay. Came back in, next day. How long did you sit? Three hours. Walk for an hour. Difficult. Killer. A lot of pain. Don't want to do that anymore. Good. Why don't you sit longer? <laughs> so I went in the next day. How long did you sit? Four hours. Walk for an hour. Never want to do that again. Did you move? Yeah, I moved all over the place. It was painful. It's hard to do. Well, don't move. <laughs> so I came in the next day and I had tears running down my, my cheeks because of the intense pain. I wasn't crying. It was just my ears. It's like you hit your head and your ears to your eyes uh, water. And he said, how long did you sit? Four hours. Did you move? No. And that's the worst experience of my life. He said, good, why don't you sit longer? I said, no. <laughs> now, eventually, I did start sitting longer. I was sitting six hours, seven hours, eight hours. And then I would get up from the meditation and I would walk maybe three steps and go, why did I break that sitting? And I would sit down and I'd sit for another two or three hours. But what was the advantage of doing that? Well, one of the side effects of it is I have blood clots in my legs now. And I got to understand pain pretty well, because it's really painful to sit that long. In the teaching of the Noble Ones, there is a state called Sanyavedayeta Niroda, which means the cessation of perception and feeling. The attainment of this state is called Niroda Samapati, which means the attainment of cessation. This is the highest possible meditative attainment. The attainment of this state is simultaneous with the attainment of the Anagami path or further. That is to say that the attainment of this state entails that one will never again return to this human realm. The Sutuadans have rejected the teaching of the Noble Ones and believe that some alterations are required here. First, they call their version of this state the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness. The Blessed One did not speak in this way and we can assure you that he had good reasons for using the words and phrases that he did. Then, they changed the definition of Sotapanna or Stream Enterer to be someone who has attained cessation. They take this attainment associated with the end of the path and move it to the beginning. At first glance, this would seem to be raising the bar and making progress more difficult. But remember, that we are talking about two different things here, the twim cessation and the genuine cessation. Attaining the twim cessation is so easy that Bhante Wilmaramsi has claimed that over half of the students attain stream entry on their first 10-day twim retreat. Further, they claim that each path and fruition is associated with an attainment of cessation. Since there are four paths and four fruitions, this means that in the twim model, attaining cessation eight times makes one an arahant. The Sutuadans believe that in order to attain cessation, one must engage in the twim progressive relaxation technique for six hours a day and at least three hours in one sit. Basically, one must sit and wait and cessation will occur. The unstated subtext is that one must be sleep deprived at the time one sits down for the session. The connection between sleep deprivation and the twim cessation is not explained to the twim students. Rather, they just find themselves being pressured to do two things simultaneously, sit longer and sleep less. And this is where those micro-sleeps come in. When a sleep deprived person sits down, closes their eyes, and reminds themselves to relax over and over, which is the basic version of the TWIM method, they are sure to experience micro-sleeps and lapses of attention. It goes like this. A student of TWIM is deprived of sleep for days or weeks on end. They then sit down, 
remaining perfectly still for three hours while progressively relaxing their head and brain, which is to say, relaxing away their mindfulness and alertness. And due to these conditions, they experience one or more micro-sleeps or lapses of attention. Later, when they're being interviewed by the teacher, the teacher asks them, did you experience anything unusual? The student says, well, yeah, I kind of clicked out for a split second, like that blackout state Bonte talks about. The teacher then says, congratulations, you're a Sotapanna. The problem is that this student is not, in fact, a Sotapanna. They've simply been misled. We have spoken to several of these twim Sotapannas, and they have expressed to us that they still have doubt. They felt rushed through the process and do not feel at all secure in their practice. We have even spoken to a twim Anagami, Oleg Pavlov, who felt the same way, that these are not true attainments. They're like a memory of a dream. This is exactly what one sees with a post-hypnotic suggestion or hysterical experience. This is a totally mundane experience common to many methods of meditation. Most schools tell their students to totally disregard these episodes. Some, like the Sutuedans, assign special significance to them. In the teaching of the Noble Ones, these are recognized as the hindrance of sloth and torpor and inattention. This Twem cessation experience appears to be identical to what Tom Campbell, Robert Bruce, and other lucid dreaming and astral projection enthusiasts refer to as clicking out. And we doubt that the Sutuedans consider all of the thousands of people who have experienced this clicking out to be Sotapanas. Even ordinary people who are not meditators at all experience this. Oleg Pavlov, the former Sutuedan who mastered the Twem cessation, told us that he encountered a truck driver who could also enter this state at will and without difficulty and used it to take rest on long journeys. Oleg came to realize the truth about this state. It is simply a state of deep sleep. This is not the true cessation of perception and feeling, although there may be some superficial resemblance. There's an expression, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. People are able to attain this twim cessation without becoming anagamis or arahants, without achieving any insight into the Dhamma, and go on to act in ways that the noble ones are right to criticize. So how can these false cessation experiences be differentiated from the genuine cessation, given that their descriptions sound similar? The reason that the descriptions sound similar is that we are at the limits of what can be expressed by language. The cessation of perception and feeling is the highest possible attainment. It is up to the practitioner to honestly and thoroughly investigate his experiences in line with the Dhamma. Can he go further? Is there more to see here? Did he bring mindfulness and alertness into this, or was his mind clouded by sloth and torpor? Whoever experiences the genuine cessation of perception and feeling will know for themselves how it differs in quality from micro-sleep, inattention, and deep sleep. The Sutavadans rely on sleep deprivation, suggestion and leading questions, and extended sitting in order to get the results they do. The genuine cessation does not require any of these. It requires right samadhi, it requires diligence and integrity, it requires practicing the true Noble Eightfold Path. For one who clings to these yogic sleep deprivation practices and these other false views, they will not encounter the genuine cessation of perception and feeling, but only these lesser, mundane states of microsleep and inattention. Claim The links of dependent origination are really tiny lights or bubbles. And right after that, you'll get to a place where the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness disappear. When you come back and you see this starting to arise again, very quickly you'll see little tiny teeny bubbles, very fast, arise and pass away. You are starting to see the links of dependent origination. 
And that's when you experience Nibbana. You'll have a lot of joy arise. In that process of looking at it, what I saw was these little tiny flickers, these tiny little lights or figures or circular things. And what, what those were, were the first samskaras, the first formations that were arising and creating the process of the rest of the links of dependent origination to arise. Seeing lights during meditation, sensory deprivation, or simply resting with the eyes closed is extremely common. Much has been made of these lights over the centuries. Many teachers in many traditions believe that simply seeing any light constitutes awakening or some other attainment. In his 45 years of teaching, the Blessed One never once thought to compare the links of dependent origination to little lights or bubbles seen in the visual field. We are familiar with these phenomena. We have also spoken with former TWIM students who have seen these lights. They report that seeing the lights resulted in no insight whatsoever into dependent origination and no reduction in the defilements of their mind. Here, we can even show you a representation of these lights, this experience that the Suthawadans cling to as being dependent origination. We can unequivocally state that these lights are not, in fact, dependent origination. When the Blessed One referred to seeing dependent origination, he was not referring to seeing anything in the visual sense. To see is to bear witness. When one sees dependent origination, they are witnessing the truth of it for themselves. They are seeing how things work. There is no visual sense at this time. Claim. The Brahma Viharas are a feeling Vedana meditation. In the, in the course of our practice, we use loving kindness as a feeling, as a psychosomatic feeling that is experienced as loving kindness or compassion or joy or equanimity as we progress. So I, when I give you the instructions, I'm telling you this is a feeling meditation. It is not a mental meditation. On first hearing these statements, it may not be immediately apparent what is being said. This is in part due to differences between the Pali and English languages, and in part due to the Sutuadans having misapprehended the teaching. In the teaching of the Noble Ones, there are three kinds of feeling, called Vedana in Pali, pleasant feeling, painful feeling, and neither pleasant nor painful feeling. Here, the word feeling is used with the primary connotation of sensation. This differs from the word's primary connotation in English, which is to do with emotions. The Brahma Viharas are the development of these four states of mind, goodwill, compassion, sympathetic joy, and equanimity. When the Suthuedans say that the Brahma Viharas are a feeling meditation, they are explicitly and implicitly using the word feeling in the sense of Vedana or sensation. They are actually referring not to goodwill, compassion, sympathetic joy, and equanimity, but rather to a pleasant feeling in the chest which moves up into the forehead. This is how the Blessed One described the first Brahma Vihara. There is the case where an individual keeps pervading the first direction, as well as the second, the third, and the fourth, with an awareness imbued with goodwill. Thus, he keeps pervading above, below, and all around, everywhere, and in every respect, the all-encompassing cosmos with an awareness imbued with goodwill. Abundant, expansive, immeasurable, free from hostility, free from ill will. He savors that, longs for that, finds satisfaction through that. Note that there is no mention of feeling. This is because the Brahma Viharas are not a feeling meditation. They're about a state of heart and mind, an attitude, a disposition. This is very important. If one mistakes a sensation in one's head for compassion, then one is liable to do grave harm to other beings, all while thinking oneself to be very compassionate. This is a deeply twisted, deeply evil, deeply deluded state to be in. 
one from which it is very difficult to recover. And this is the state that the twim teaching tends to lead people into by establishing these false associations, by making these and other subversive alterations to the teaching of the Noble Ones. Claim The Buddha taught loving-kindness meditation more than he taught mindfulness of breathing. But you know that the Buddha taught loving-kindness meditation a lot more than he taught mindfulness of breathing. The Buddha spoke of using the Brahma-Vihara practice quite a bit more than using the breathing practice, contrary to what most meditation practitioners have been led to believe. The Brahma-Vihara practice was taught by the Buddha, not as a side practice as most think, but as a primary practice to lead the meditator to the goal of awakening. Originally, it was Bhante Wilmaramsi who made this claim. There must have been some pushback, because, uncharacteristically, David Johnson actually tried to find some evidence to back it up. Even so, he didn't try very hard. What he did was make a very casual review of a limited subset of English translations of the suttas, counting mentions of the word metta as teaching the jhanas via the brahmaviharas. The problem with this is twofold. Firstly, it's simply false. Anapana, which means in and out breathing, is mentioned more than metta, no matter how you slice it. And secondly, an honest reading of the suttas shows that anapanasati was the preferred method of entering jhana, and so of course it wouldn't be mentioned explicitly in every instance. Let's take a look at what we get when we examine the Pali suttas in full, rather than only a subset of English translations, and see if this claim holds up to scrutiny. The meditative state based on the in and out breath is called anapanasati samadhi, literally, in and out breath mindfulness samadhi, while the meditative state based on loving kindness is called metta cheta vimutti, literally, goodwill awareness liberation. Here we see 58 mentions for anapanasati samadhi and only 12 for metta cheta vimutti. Even though this makes the point, Understand that counting words is an inherently flawed methodology. The understanding comes from an honest and thorough reading, not from counting words. Claim Progress with metta meditation is faster than with breath meditation. It's because there's no good feeling that is quickly generated from just observing the breath. I don't like teaching mindfulness of breathing so much just because it takes so long for progress to occur. Now, in 10 days, there were people that experienced Nibbana and 10 day retreat. If you're doing mindfulness of breathing, it's going to take you at least six weeks to get where you do with loving kindness in 10 days. It takes a long time. But the Buddha came out and said that your progress in meditation is much faster with loving kindness meditation than it is any other kind of meditation. I mean, Bhante, our teacher, has said it's actually seven times quicker for people to get into jhana this way than using the breath. Mm -hmm. This is another often repeated claim from Bhante Wangaramsi that appears to have no basis in the suttas. Nowhere did the Blessed One say any such thing. If it were really true that the Brahma Viharas were so much faster and so superior to Anapanasati, then why, in the entirety of the Pali Canon, is this fact never mentioned? Why did the Blessed One even teach Anapanasati, Satipatthana, and so on? Delson Armstrong has said that there is no good feeling that is quickly generated from just observing the breath. Perhaps this is true but it only shows that he has no experience with the breath meditation that the Blessed One actually taught. When the Blessed One had the occasion to teach his own son meditation, he chose to teach him mindfulness of breathing. If this were such a slow and worthless practice as the Suttawedans claim, why would he do such a thing? In the teaching of the Noble Ones, the genuine Brahma-viharas are practiced in addition to mindfulness of breathing, not in place of it. 
Here's what the Blessed One had to say about mindfulness of breathing. Rahula, develop the meditation of mindfulness of in and out breathing. Mindfulness of in and out breathing, when developed and pursued, is of great fruit, of great benefit. Of course, in order to receive that great fruit and great benefit, one must actually follow the Noble Eightfold Path laid out by the Blessed One, not some altered practice. Claim The Brahma Viharas are an automatic process you can't control, not willed and volitionally produced. Remember, the Brahma Vihara practice is something that happens automatically. No need to figure this out, just start with Metta, and you will go up the chain of Viharas. David Johnson, in his book, The Path to Nibbana, used the word automatic no less than 26 times. The theme is clear. It's supposed to all occur automatically, without being steered, without will and volition. When confronted with the sutta evidence that these states are willed and volitionally produced, and not automatic, the Suttuadans continue to cling to this wrong view. Why, in his 45-year teaching career, is this feeling in the chest or head never once mentioned in reference to the Brahma Viharas? It is because this is not at all the same practice. This is what the Blessed One Himself said regarding the Brahma Vihara of goodwill. He reflects on this and discerns. This awareness released through goodwill is fabricated and intended. Neither the Brahma Viharas nor the Jhanas are automatic. All of these states are willed and volitionally produced. It's only because of not having practiced the true Brahma Viharas and Jhanas and not having penetrated the Dhamma that the Suttavadans can believe otherwise. Claim the Buddha taught people to smile and laugh all the time. And if you don't smile, I will make you smile. And then I did something that's not in the suttas, formally, but it, it implies it in a lot of places, and that is to smile. Now, this is one of the reasons that I want you to keep practicing daily, all the time, smiling. So the more you can practice smiling during the day, whether you feel like smiling or not, then you will begin to have an uplifted mind. That's what the Buddha was teaching us. And there is a net mention in one of the sutta that smiling, the Buddha encouraged smiling. But they didn't hear. And this is what I'm talking about. Yes, he did encourage smiling. He and he said, "Look at all of my monks. They're they're all clean. They're well fed, and they're happy and smiling. And the faces of the monks are very bright and clear." You might not know this. Anda mungkin tidak tahu. When I go to a monastery, kalau beliau datang kepada satu wihara, and we speak the same language, dan mereka berbicara dengan bahasa yang sama, we're giggling and laughing a lot. Mereka itu tertawa dan uh, bercanda. Why? Mengapa? Because we're happy. Karena kita bahagia. That's what the Buddha teaches us. Itulah yang sang Buddha ajarkan pada kita. The Buddha said, we are the happy ones. Sang Buddha mengatakan, kitalah yang berbahagia. But if you go to a Vipassana retreat, Tapi kalau anda pergi ke retret Vipassana, you don't see happy faces. Anda tidak melihat wajah bahagia. This is a smiling meditation. The reason that you should smile is because it has been found that when the corners of your mouth go up, so does your mental state. When the corners of your mouth go down, so does your mental state. It can be a mechanical smile at first, eventually. It will turn into a sincere happy feeling. It should be a smile that conveys loving kindness. It's important to believe it. Smile with your lips, smile from your mind, and smile from your heart. Smile. I don't feel like smiling. I don't care. 
Bhante Wemaramsi teaches his followers to smile without a reason, to smile all the time, and to smile insincerely. The Sutuadans place such an emphasis on smiling that one would expect there to be some basis for that in the teaching of the Noble Ones, but there is no such basis. We find very few references to smiling and laughing in the discourses of the Blessed One, and those we do find indicate the opposite of what Bhante Wilmramsi is suggesting. He should abandon weariness, deception, laughter, sports, sexual intercourse, and all that goes with it, should not practice casting spells, interpret dreams, physical marks, the stars, animal cries, should not be devoted to doing cures or inducing fertility. On one occasion, the Blessed One was wandering on a tour among the Kassalans with a large Sangha of monks. As he was going along a road, he saw a large Sal forest in a certain place. Going down from the road, he went into the forest. On reaching it, he plunged into it and at a certain spot broke into a smile. Then, the thought occurred to Venerable Ananda. What is the cause? What is the reason for the Blessed Ones breaking into a smile? It's not without purpose that Tathagatas break into a smile. Claim. The five hindrances are your best friends and should be invited into your mind. Be grateful for the opportunity to have a hindrance arise. Don't fight with it. Hindrances are not something to fight with. They're not something to try to push away. They're not something that you can control. A big mistake that a lot of meditators try to do is stop it from coming up. And as you become more and more familiar with how the hindrances work, you start to regard them as being friends. They are your best friends because they're teaching you how your mind works. Now, the hindrances, as much as people don't like me saying this, are your best teachers. I mean head and shoulders higher than any other kind of teaching that you could possibly learn because the hindrances are showing you where your attachments are. They're your best friends. What is implied by this claim is that the meditation is supposed to be done in such a way that the hindrances are invited into the mind and then dealt with repeatedly using the twim 6R process. The Sutuadans believe that it is possible and even encouraged to be entertaining the hindrances when in jhana, and they have explicitly stated that the hindrances should not be prevented from arising. This view stands in complete contradiction to the teaching of the Noble Ones, where it is made very clear that the five hindrances are to be abandoned and prevented from arising as a preparatory step without which it is impossible to enter jhana. This is what the Blessed One said about this matter. Further, the monk should consider, are the five hindrances abandoned in me? If on reflection he knows, the five hindrances are not abandoned in me, he should make an effort for the abandoning of the five hindrances. But if, on reflection, he knows, the five hindrances are abandoned in me, then he should dwell in refreshment and joy, training day and night in skillful qualities. Monks, without abandoning six things, one is incapable of entering and remaining in the first jhana. Which six? Sensual desire, ill will, sloth and drowsiness, restlessness and anxiety, uncertainty, that is, the five hindrances, and one has not seen well, with right discernment, as they have come to be, the drawbacks of sensuality. Without abandoning these six things, one is incapable of entering and remaining in the first jhana. In the same way, when these five hindrances are not abandoned in himself, the monk regards it as a debt, a sickness, a prison, slavery, a road through desolate country, but when these hindrances are abandoned in himself, he regards it as unindebtedness, good health, release from prison, freedom, 
a place of security, when he sees that they have been abandoned within him, gladness is born. In one who is gladdened, rapture is born. Enraptured at heart, his body grows calm. His body calm, he is sensitive to pleasure. Feeling pleasure, his mind becomes concentrated. The thought, the five hindrances are your best friends, should be recognized for what it is. This is Mara's thought. These are Mara's words. Anyone saying this is possessed by Mara, has taken Mara's intentions, aims, and goals to be their own. Claim. There is such a thing as meditation pain and you should just press through it. When a painful feeling arises, it's there. That's the truth. Anytime you try to fight with the truth, anytime you try to change the truth, anytime you try to make the truth be the way you want it to be, that is a cause of suffering. So allow it to be there by itself. Yes, it's painful. Sometimes it can be quite painful. We don't care. Let it be there. Let go of your stories about, oh, it hurt so much, I wanted to stop, I can't stand it. And you turn it into an emergency. And then you have to get up and start walking, so you break your city. Meditation pain can arise anywhere in your body. Meditation pain is caused by breaking a precept. Meditation pain can come up into your body. These six are, the pain doesn't go away necessarily. But your, your attachment to the pain starts going away. You might have to go back and keep doing it over and over again because it keeps pulling your attention to it. Fine. It arises, vibration of some sort, or even pain can arise. Don't move your body. Don't wiggle your toes. Don't wiggle your, your fingers. Don't scratch. Don't rub. Don't change your posture. Don't rock back and forth. Sit very still. There are two different kinds of pain that a meditator can experience while doing the meditation. There is real pain and there is meditation pain. The way to tell the difference is this. The other kind of pain that can sometimes arise can be just as intense as the real pain. But when the meditator gets up to do the walking meditation, the pain goes away after a short period of time. This is called a meditation pain. When the meditator recognizes this kind of pain, it is best to sit through it without moving at all. The author promises that if the meditator does this, they will have some wonderful experiences when the pain fades away by itself. Promise. Bhante Wimaramsi himself was crippled by following just this advice. And yet, he didn't learn from that. He went on to give this same dangerous advice to his own students for over 20 years. People of all ages and levels of health go to twim retreats where they are given these instructions. People who may have never meditated before in their lives suddenly being told to sit for a minimum of six hours a day and three hours in one sitting. There is no such thing as this meditation pain that Bhante Wilmaramsi spoke of, and ignoring pain is very likely to lead to severe injury and disability which would make further sitting impossible. People have suffered grave and irreparable harm from having heard this advice. Bhante Wilmaramsi himself suffered from blood clots limited use of his legs, strokes, and other health problems as a result of practicing in this way. If there's pain that only appears when sitting, then something about the sitting is causing the pain, even if only the amount of sitting. It's unnecessary to sit through pain. It's far better to learn how to sit properly and in an appropriate amount. It doesn't matter if you're sitting on the floor or in a chair like the Suthoidans recommend. The chair may be easier on your knees, but far worse for your back. 2,600 years ago, we sat on our robes, or on a bunch of kusa grass, or on a pile of leaves, when our body had become stiff and sore from sitting or lying down. We walked back and forth to stretch our limbs. Only after our body had recovered did we sit down again. Those of us who sat for longer did so after having worked up to that amount of sitting 
over a long period of time and while abiding in elevated states in which the mind is liberated from pain, liberated from bodily concerns. It is indeed possible to master all of the meditations in the teaching of the Noble Ones without sitting longer than one hour per sit and for a total of two hours per day. Even so, this amount should be worked up to over a period of time safely and without pain and not enforced on any person who is not accustomed to it. The Sutuadans refuse to be convinced on this point. Whenever one of their students is injured by following these instructions, they claim that it was because the student broke a precept or the student was already injured before starting, and so on, even when these claims are totally false. And many of their followers are so totally devoted that they believe it and blame themselves for these serious injuries. Claim You should choose a spiritual friend to whom to radiate Metta. Stay with the same spiritual friend all of the time. Don't jump from one person to another person to another person. Stay with that one spiritual friend. They're the same sex, they're alive. For the first 10 minutes of your sitting, radiate loving kindness to yourself. Wrap yourself up in that happy, tranquil feeling using the previous instructions. For the rest of the sitting, radiate loving and kind thoughts to a spiritual friend. Your spiritual friend should be someone who you deeply respect and sincerely wish well. They are someone who makes you smile when you think of them. It might be a favorite teacher or counselor who has your highest goals in mind. It might be a friend who always has your back and supports whatever you do. So I am your, what is called Kaliamita. I am your spiritual friend. This term that Bhante Wilmaramsi referred to, Kaliana Mitta, Kaliana, means fine, admirable, excellent, beautiful. Mitta means quite simply, friend. An appropriate translation of this term is admirable friend. Naturally, most of his male students chose Bhante Wilmaramsi as their spiritual friend, and his female students chose Sister Kema. The concept of choosing a spiritual friend to use as an object for the Brahmavihara practice is not found anywhere in the teaching of the Noble Ones. In fact, this goes quite against the instructions for the genuine Brahmaviharas, which specify that the attitude of goodwill should be cultivated with regard to all beings at once, excluding none. This is how the Blessed One described the development of goodwill. Think happy, at rest. May all beings be happy, at heart. Whatever beings there may be, weak or strong, without exception, long, large, middling, short, subtle, gross, seen and unseen, living near and far away, born or seeking birth, may all beings be happy at heart. Claim. The bodily fabrication is tension and tightness in the head. Now, when you're practicing this, your mind is on your object of meditation, say the breath, and your mind is distracted. You let go of the distraction, then tranquilize. That's what it says to do right here. Tranquilize the bodily formation. What is it talking about? That tension and tightness is in your head, in your mind. I shall breathe in, tranquilizing the bodily formation. Here we go again. The tranquilizing of the bodily formation is letting go of the tension in the head. But lady, what is the bodily formation? What is the verbal formation? What is the mental formation? In breathing and out breathing, friend Visaka are the bodily formation. Now, again, I might consider changing that a little bit so that mindfulness of the body is also relaxing and letting go of the tension and tightness in your head. Because when you relax that tension and tightness in your head, 
You let go of that tension and tightness in your mind at the same time. So this is being mindful of your body. So it doesn't only just include in breathing and out breathing. This term, bodily fabrication, has a very specific meaning in the teaching of the Noble Ones. Fabrication and formation are translations of the Pali word Sankara. There is no one English word which entirely captures the meaning of Sankara. Translating it as activity or motion makes the meaning more clear in this context. With respect to the jhanas, the bodily activity refers to the in and out breathing, which is the only bodily activity still occurring in the first through the third jhanas. Never once in the discourses of the Blessed One is the bodily activity stated to be this tension and tightness in the head, which as we have already discussed, is something idiosyncratic, specific to Bhante Waramsi and a certain percentage of the population sharing his chronic scalp tension disorder. This is how the bodily activity is described in the suttas. And how is a monk calmed in his bodily fabrication? There is the case where a monk, with the abandoning of pleasure and pain, as with the earlier disappearance of elation and distress, enters and remains in the fourth jhana, purity of equanimity and mindfulness, neither pleasure nor pain. This is how a monk is calmed in bodily fabrication. In and out breaths are bodily. These things are tied up with the body. That's why in and out breaths are bodily fabrications. When one has attained the fourth jhana, in and out breathing has ceased. For the fourth jhana, in and out breaths are thorns. Like so many statements made by Bhante Wilmramsi, when one looks to the teaching of the Noble Ones, one finds that what he has stated is simply untrue. It is not good to misrepresent the Blessed One. Claim The six R's are the entirety of the Noble Eightfold Path. The six R's The six R's are the fourth Noble Truth. Every time you use the six R's, you are practicing the entire Eightfold Path. Every time you smile, you are practicing the entire Eightfold Path at that time. The six R's are the core of the TWEM method. These six steps are said to be the whole of the practice, and if one just keeps six R'ing everything, the Brahma-Viharas and Jhanas will unfold for one, culminating eventually in awakening. The truth is that in his 45-year teaching career, the Blessed One never once mentioned these six R's and gave specific instructions on how to practice that didn't bear any resemblance to the six R's. Let's compare the six R's to the Noble Eightfold Path. For the six R's, we have the following sequence of steps. Recognize, release, relax, re-smile, return, repeat. And now, the Noble Eightfold Path. Right view, right resolve, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, right samadhi. Bhante Wimaramsi and his disciples make these claims counting on the fact that no one will call them on it, no one will question them on it. In these six steps of the six R's, where do you see right view? Where do you see right resolve? Where do you see right speech? Where do you see right action? Where do you see right livelihood? Where do you see right effort? Where do you see right mindfulness? Where do you see right samadhi? You don't. Not one of these eight factors is represented in the six R's. Claim. 
The six R's are identical to right effort. According to the Buddhist teaching, according to the Eightfold Path, the six R's are right effort. Mm -hmm. Or I call it harmonious practice. Which is part of right effort, which is a very important part of the Eightfold Path. In right effort, you recognize that your mind is distracted. The second part is that you release the distraction. You don't keep your attention on the distraction. And you relax the tightness caused by that distraction. What is the tightness? The tightness is that tightness in your head. In the explanation of the Eightfold Path in the suttas, one of the components is right effort. Right effort and the six R's are exactly the same things. According to the Buddha's teaching, according to the Eightfold Path, the six R's are right effort. The Sutta Vedans frequently claim that their six R's are identical to the right effort that the Blessed One taught, or that they supersede it by adding something new, without removing anything. However, even a cursory glance shows that the six R's are not identical to right effort and are not a superset to the components of right effort. The first and most obvious difference is that the six R's is a linear series of steps. Right effort, however, is a set of rules, each one to be enacted at the appropriate time and in no particular order. TWIM's six R's consists of the following steps. Recognize, release, relax, re-smile, return, repeat. The repeat step signifies that this is a cycle meant to be repeated throughout the meditation practice. Now, here is how the Blessed One explained right effort. There is the case where a monk generates desire, endeavors, activates persistence, upholds and exerts his intent for the sake of the non-arising of evil, unskillful qualities that have not yet arisen. He generates desire, endeavors, activates persistence, upholds and exerts his intent for the sake of the abandoning of evil, unskillful qualities that have arisen. He generates desire, endeavors, activates persistence, upholds and exerts his intent for the sake of the arising of skillful qualities that have not yet arisen. He generates desire, endeavors, activates persistence, upholds and exerts his intent for the maintenance, non-confusion, increase, plentitude, development, and culmination of skillful qualities that have arisen. This, monks, is called right effort. Note that the right effort of the Noble Ones is not a series of steps and is not limited to formal meditation practice. Rather, it is a set of rules or policies to be lived by. Notice the general terms of unskillful and skillful qualities, rather than some limited and specific instruction about something as superficial as smiling. An important part of right effort is omitted from the TWIM 6R method. It is this. A monk generates desire, endeavors, activates persistence, upholds and exerts his intent for the sake of the non-arising of evil, unskillful qualities that have not yet arisen. The Sutta Vedans totally reject this part of right effort. They reject the generating desire, endeavoring, activating persistence, upholding and exerting intent on the basis that that is doing something and they believe that the Blessed One taught non-doing. And they reject for the sake of the non-arising of evil, unskillful qualities that have not yet arisen, 
because they consider the five hindrances to be their best friends and wish to invite them into their minds. Truly, the Sutawaitans reject all of right effort through their many revisions. What they teach is wrong effort. When David Johnson was writing his book about the TWIM method, he decided to support this claim that the six R's are identical to right effort by shamelessly misrepresenting right effort in order to create a false equivalence. What is right effort? You notice that an unwholesome state has arisen. You stop paying attention to that unwholesome feeling, letting it be there by itself, with no pushing away or holding on to it. You bring up a wholesome feeling. You stay with that wholesome feeling. Why would he need to resort to such a deceptive tactic? Why couldn't he simply quote from the suttas? The reason is that David Johnson's goal wasn't to uphold the truth. His goal was to support the misrepresentations given by his teacher, Bhante Wamramsi. Claim Mudita is identical with Piti, specifically the awakening factor of Piti. As you go deeper, the compassion changes to a feeling of joy. Now, one of the things in the suttas, they try to talk about sympathetic joy and altruistic, altruistic yeah. joy, but those are concepts. And you haven't got time for concepts when you're in this. It is joy. Mm. It is the awakening factor of joy. Mm. It's a very happy feeling, but it doesn't have excitement that the lower jhanas have. Yeah, you have that equanimity going along as well. And this is called infinite consciousness. This claim is made possible by Bhante Wimaramsi's habit of being very loose in translations and changing them to suit his idiosyncratic views. Mudita, the attitude of the third Brahmavihara, really is sympathetic joy. It is stated in the suttas that Mudita is opposed to resentment. This makes the meaning of the word very clear. Mudita is the kind of joy that one feels for another being's good fortune. It is a selfless joy. He should be told, Don't say that. You shouldn't speak in that way. Don't misrepresent the Blessed One, for it's not right to misrepresent the Blessed One. And the Blessed One wouldn't say that. It's impossible. There is no way that, when empathetic joy, mudita, has been developed, pursued, handed the reins, taken as a basis, steadied, consolidated, and well undertaken as an awareness release, resentment would still keep overpowering the mind. That possibility doesn't exist. For this is the escape from resentment, empathetic joy as an awareness release. To give a mundane example of mudita, Suppose that two men are up for the same promotion, and the boss gives the promotion to the second man. The first man, hearing of the boss's decision, has a choice. He can feel resentment for the second man, or he can feel mudita, sympathetic joy for his competitor's good fortune, or he could feel equanimity. Piti, joy or rapture, is another thing. Here, we have a sutta where the Blessed One explains a mastery practice in which one develops mudita along with piti. If they were one and the same thing, then this would not make any sense. But they are not, in fact, the same thing. And anyone willing to follow the Blessed One's instructions with diligence and integrity can witness this for themselves. When this concentration is thus developed, thus well developed by you, you should then train yourself thus. Empathetic joy, mudita, as my awareness release, will be developed, pursued, given a means of transport, given a grounding, steadied, consolidated, and well undertaken. That's how you should train yourself. When you have developed this concentration in this way, you should develop this concentration with directed thought and evaluation, 
You should develop it with no directed thought and a modicum of evaluation. You should develop it with no directed thought and no evaluation. You should develop it accompanied by rapture, piti. You should develop it not accompanied by rapture. You should develop it endowed with a sense of enjoyment. You should develop it endowed with equanimity. Claim. The seven factors of awakening are in need of amendment. And I wanted to, at one time, I, I thought very seriously about nine awakening factors. One is curiosity. And the second was persistence. And that's what, what it really takes. But as I started uh, giving more talks to monks and that sort of thing, they decided it wasn't such a good idea. So I, I let it go. The Seven Factors of Awakening, otherwise known as the Wings of Awakening, are Mindfulness, Investigation of Qualities, Energy, Rapture, Tranquility, Samadhi, and Equanimity. Bhante Wilramsi wished to add curiosity and persistence, obviously finding the Blessed One's presentation to be inadequate. But it is, in fact, only Bhante Wilramsi's understanding of the teaching which was inadequate. We can plainly see that these two are already present as investigation of qualities satisfies curiosity and energy satisfies persistence. Bhante Wamaramsi should have spent more time listening to these monks who talked him out of this silly idea. As it happened, he never learned this lesson and continued to assume at every turn that it was the Blessed One who had made the mistake rather than himself. Claim the point of the practice is to appreciate the things around you. Delighting in food is consistent with the path. The whole point of practicing uh, the six R's and loving kindness is you want to have an uplifted, happy mind. You don't want to dwell on negative things. And spend a lot more time appreciating things around you. I went to a very fancy uh, meal. When I was in Burma, I was invited by this big monk to go with him because it was a, a special occasion. They gave him the best food. I mean, this is top of the line, best food that they could possibly afford. And as he was eating it, he was saying, Dukkha, Dukkha, Dukkha. Well, to my way of thinking, that's wrong understanding. It's not Dukkha, it's Sukkha. <laughs> And there was a bowl of mangoes there. And I picked it up. Now, with mindfulness, I was trying to see where all of the little tastes were. Yeah, this mindfulness of It's salty, then it's sweet, and then it... it, it so instead it, of raisins, you've got a mango going here. Yeah. yeah. Much better. And I saw the feeling come up, and I relaxed, and I let it be. And I didn't have any thoughts after that. And I was experiencing the mango by itself, without any kind of distraction, without thinking, oh, I had a better mango than this last right. year. That didn't even come the up. The thoughts and stories, it was the, just the, the it's taste. just the that experience that's without pleasant. any kind of disturbance. With what I say, and I told somebody, oh, I like mangoes. I had so many mangoes given to me, it was unbelievable. Or I like chocolate. I had boxes of chocolate. When I was uh, in Malaysia with Chief Reverend, at the time there was a fence around the uh, monastery and I was up in a room that was very close to that fence and on the other side of the fence was a uh, mango tree. Now this, my room is where I did a lot of radiating loving kindness and I started noticing this mango tree, it had mangoes coming over the fence, but on the other side of the tree there was no mangoes. <laughs> And those mangoes were sweet, like you can't believe. 
And it was really remarkable fruit because the mango tree was responding to the loving kindness. And then you do it. Uh, and people look at me like I'm some kind of a weird person because you were here when I was eating sugar. And I, I just decided I don't want to do that anymore. So I didn't. So I don't eat chocolates very seldom. I don't eat a lot of uh, things from getting candies and that sort of thing. I do have one weakness. Cinnamon gummy bears. Cinnamon gummy bears? Cinnamon bears are tough. <laughs> no, don't think about them. I'm, I don't need them right now for sure. I'm, I'm just now starting to lose some good weight here. Very high in carbs. That's before you develop. <laughs> but when I started on this diet, okay, I'm, I'm supposed to eat meat, I'm supposed to eat veggies, I'm supposed to eat salad, that's it. You don't know how much I like bread. And potatoes. And potatoes. And even rice every now and then. Here is what the Blessed Ones said about taking delight in the world. Monks, devas and human beings take pleasure in forms, delight in forms, rejoice in forms. With the change, fading away, and cessation of forms, devas and human beings dwell in suffering and stress. But the Tathagata monks, worthy and rightly self-awakened, knowing, as they have come to be, the origination, the disappearance, the allure the drawbacks of, and escape from, forms, doesn't take pleasure in forms, delight in forms, rejoice in forms. With the change, fading away and cessation of forms, the Tathagata dwells happily. Contrast Bhante Waramsi's love of mangoes, chocolates, and other sweets with this clear explanation given by the Blessed One. And how is physical food to be regarded? Suppose a couple, husband and wife, taking meager provisions, were to travel through a desert. With them would be their only baby son, dear and appealing. Then, the meager provisions of the couple going through the desert would be used up and depleted, while there was still a stretch of the desert yet to be crossed. The thought would occur to them. Our meager provisions are used up and depleted while there is still a stretch of the desert yet to be crossed. What if we were to kill this only baby son of ours, dear and appealing, and make dried meat and jerky? That way, chewing on the flesh of our son, at least the two of us would make it through this desert. Otherwise, all three of us would perish. So they would kill their only baby son, loved and endearing, and make dried meat and jerky. Chewing on the flesh of their son, they would make it through the desert. While eating the flesh of their son, they would beat their breasts, crying, Where have you gone, our only baby son? Where have you gone, our only baby son? Now, what do you think, monks? Would that couple eat that food playfully, or for intoxication, or for putting on bulk, or for beautification. Monks, whoever delights in forms, delights in stress. Whoever delights in stress is not released from stress, I tell you. Whoever delights in sounds, delights in stress. Whoever delights in aromas, delights in stress. Whoever delights in flavors, delights in stress. Whoever delights in tactile sensations, delights in stress. Monks, whoever delights in ideas, delights in stress. Whoever delights in stress is not released from stress, I tell you. In the same way, where there is passion, delight, and craving for the nutriment of physical food, consciousness lands there and increases. Bhante Wimlaramsi 
was never able to understand the true nature of craving, because he stopped investigating craving as soon as he decided that it was just a tension and tightness in his head. If he had not done that, he could have saved himself and others from experiencing much suffering. Claim. A student having a hint of joy arise has attained jhana. It'll happen on its own. I wouldn't talk to them like that. They wouldn't understand it. I talk in more simple terms. Um, while you're sitting, do you experience joy? <laughs> when the joy fades away, are you able to stay with your object of meditation a little bit more easily? More at ease? And uh, over a period of time, it starts to last a little bit longer? Now that's getting into jhana. But I'm not going to tell them that you're getting into jhana because there's too many ideas that aren't um, understood. You see, it's more for the, the guide what is in each jhana so I can understand where you are and I can be able to talk to you in a language that you're going to be able to understand because you've had the experience. And that's the advantage of being with a guide and talking with them every day. This lax criteria for jhana has been confirmed by every TWIM student we've spoken with and also by written reports online. A student is asked in their interview, did you experience any joy or similar for as many days in a row as it takes for them to answer in the affirmative? As soon as they've answered in the affirmative, they're told to move on to the next jhana, even if they express doubt about having attained any jhana, and it goes on like that throughout the process, leading questions given to doubting students until finally they're told, after answering in the affirmative to, did you experience a blackout, that they've experienced Nibbana and become a Sotapanna. Here is a testimony from a TWIM student. Heck, 85% of students can get into four jhanas in four days, Maybe you've got some doubt, but you smile it away. During your few minutes with the monk, you get questioned. Did you have any meditative joy come up? Great, you are in the second jhana. Did you feel loving kindness coming from your head, not your chest? Great, you're in the fifth jhana. Did you feel any equanimity? Great, you're in the eighth jhana. And remember, you have to be honest but you should be seeing results in a few days or you're doing something wrong. Side note, these are the real jhana questions. From overhearing some interviews, I've noted that once you attain that feeling for even a bit, you jump to the next jhana on that list. Which jhana are you in, kind stranger? Students are rushed through the twim jhanas so quickly that they report it being all a blur having no ability to discern or distinguish between the different jhanas. To reiterate this point, these people have been told that they've mastered all four jhanas, all four brahmaviharas, all four formless attainments, all together in one practice, and yet they are unable to discern for themselves which of these states they were in at any particular moment. This situation is considered perfectly acceptable by the TWIM teachers. But what did the Blessed One say about this matter? In the same way, there are cases where a monk, foolish, incompetent, unfamiliar with his practice, unskilled in being quite secluded from sensuality, secluded from unskillful qualities, and entering and remaining in the first jhana, rapture, and pleasure born of seclusion, accompanied by directed thought and evaluation, doesn't stick with that theme, doesn't develop it, pursue it, or establish himself firmly in it. The thought occurs to him, what if I, with the stilling of directed thoughts and evaluations, were to enter and remain in the second jhana, rapture and pleasure born of concentration, unification of awareness, free from directed thought and evaluation, internal assurance. He is not able to enter and remain in the second jhana. The thought occurs to him, what if I were to enter and remain in the first jhana? He is not able 
to enter and remain in the first jhana. This is called a monk who has slipped and fallen from both sides, like a mountain cow, foolish, incompetent, unfamiliar with her pasture, unskilled in roaming on rugged mountains. In the teaching of the Noble Ones, it is considered foolish and incompetent to attempt to move on to the second jhana before having mastered the first. Proceeding in this way, one risks losing both the second and the first jhanas. And yet, this is exactly what the Suttavedans teach their students to do, push through the process without developing any mastery, without developing any discernment. Claim. Mindfulness is mindfulness of mind's attention moving from one object to another. It's the Buddha's teaching and his meditation. Mindfulness is remembering to observe how mind's attention moves from one thing to another. The other definition of mindfulness starts at a false premise that you are in control of your attention somehow. Yeah. Whereas this definition, remembering to observe how attention moves on its own, yes. starts with right view. Yes, exactly. It is already with that view that the attention is impersonal. Now, this part of the Satipatthana Sutta has always been really funny to me. I mean, it's just, I don't know why it even got in here. It's about the four postures. And it says again, when walking, a monk understands I am walking. When standing, he understands I am standing. When sitting, he understands I am sitting. When lying down, he understands I'm lying down. Do you know whether you're standing or not? Are you lying down now? <laughs> I mean, this is, this is really... And when I was doing straight vipassana, they said, when you get to the end of your walking, you have to note standing, 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 like I didn't know I was standing. Or walking, walking. I, come on, give me a break. The twin mindfulness, as you put it, is that remembering to observe how mind's attention moves from one object to the other. In doing so, you're seeing, in the movement of that mind, is there any craving? In the movement of that mind, is there peace or is there agitation? Is there craving or is there no craving? And by using that kind of mindfulness, you're able to immediately recognize if there's craving and use the rest of the six-hour process to let that go. So this, we really might equate it with the psychology term of cog metacognition? Metacognition, yeah. Observing the mind itself, observing how mind's attention moves, that's like mind seeing mind, so to speak, that metacognition right. of the mind. The analogy to use here is that this is your object of meditation, this is your mind. It orbits around the object of meditation. So your mind is, has this you know, flexible awareness, this flexible attention. The TWIM version of mindfulness has several peculiarities that distinguish it from mindfulness as taught by the Noble Ones. One of these was mentioned by Delson Armstrong. He evokes a picture of attention moving or orbiting or flitting around the object. This is something he no doubt inherited from his Kriya Yoga lineage. One of the main practices in that tradition involves moving the attention around the body or head in orbital motions. Right mindfulness and right samadhi are steady and still, not orbiting anything. Bhante Wimaramsi shows bewilderment at the description in the suttas of mindfulness of the body. Neither of these men have understood mindfulness as taught by the Noble Ones. The Blessed One described mindfulness on many occasions. So why did the Suttavadans feel it necessary to ignore and override those descriptions? And what is the faculty of mindfulness? There is the case where a disciple of the Noble Ones is mindful, endowed with excellent proficiency in mindfulness, remembering and recollecting what was done and said a long time ago. He remains focused on the body, in and of itself. Ardent, alert, and mindful, subduing greed and distress with reference to the world, he remains focused on feelings in and of themselves, 
the mind in and of itself, mental qualities in and of themselves, ardent, alert, and mindful, subduing greed and distress with reference to the world. This is called the faculty of mindfulness. Here, the Blessed One has described mindfulness and its four supports. These are the body, feelings, the mind, and mental qualities. This is the image that the Blessed One evoked. Just as the floor of a house rests upon and is supported by pillars placed under its four corners, even so, mindfulness rests upon and is supported by these four pillars, the body, feelings, the mind, and mental qualities. If one were to remove one or more of these pillars, the house would fall and crumble. The Sutawedan's understanding of mindfulness is limited to only one of these pillars, mindfulness of the mind. Bhante Wilmaramsi has so totally ignored the other three pillars that discussion of mindfulness of the body confounds him. He has no idea what it means or how it is practiced, as is shown by his words and actions. This, of course, relates to the Sutawedan's rejection of mindfulness of breathing, which involves all four foundations of mindfulness. Concentration through mindfulness of in and out breathing, when developed and pursued, brings the four establishings of mindfulness to completion. The four establishings of mindfulness, when developed and pursued, bring the seven factors of awakening to completion. The seven factors of awakening, when developed and pursued, bring clear knowing and release to completion. The Blessed One said, Suppose, monks, that a large crowd of people were to come thronging together, saying, The Beauty Queen, the Beauty Queen. And suppose that the Beauty Queen were highly accomplished at singing and dancing, so that an even greater crowd would come thronging, saying, The Beauty Queen is singing, the Beauty Queen is dancing. Then a man would come along, desiring life, and shrinking from death, desiring pleasure and abhorring pain, they would say to him, Now look here, mister. You must take this bowl filled to the brim with oil and carry it on your head in between the great crowd and the beauty queen. A man with a raised sword will follow right behind you, and wherever you spill even a single drop of oil, right there he will cut off your head. Now. What do you think, monks? Would that man, not paying attention to the bowl of oil, let himself get distracted outside? No, Lord. I have given you this parable to convey a meaning. The meaning is this. The bowl filled to the brim with oil stands for mindfulness immersed in the body. Thus, you should train yourselves. We will develop mindfulness immersed in the body. We will pursue it. Hand it the reins, take it as a basis, steady it, consolidate it, and undertake it well. That is how you should train yourselves. When the Sutuwedans are confronted with evidence that their understanding of mindfulness is flawed and incomplete, rather than learn from that and improve their understanding, they respond only by repeating what they have already said. Like we have seen over and over, the Sutuwedans always assume that it was the Blessed One who made a mistake in expressing himself, rather than themselves having failed to penetrate the meaning of his expressions. Claim Forgiveness meditation is something the Buddha taught and a necessary adjunct to the Brahmaviharas. Forgiveness meditation when you begin sending loving-kindness to yourself, sometimes you might encounter a barrier that makes it difficult to bring up the feeling of loving-kindness inside you. This can also happen when a meditator is coming to learn this and they have been going through some traumatic change in their life. 
Such situations might put you in despair and you feel like giving up meditation altogether. But don't lose hope if this is the case. There is a way to help. The TWIM teaching places a heavy emphasis on a practice they call forgiveness meditation. Students are instructed to switch to this practice whenever they encounter some difficulty in practicing the TWIM Brahmaviharas. There are two types of the TWIM forgiveness practice. The first type involves conjuring up a mental image of a person one has hard feelings for and repeating the mantra, I forgive you, you forgive me, directed at their mental image for as long as it takes for the mental image to say back to you, I forgive you too. The second type involves walking while repeating the mantra, I forgive you, you forgive me, in sync with the pace of walking. The first type of practice, involving conversing with a mental image of a hated person, has been a triggering event for psychosis and other bad outcomes in some TWIM students. There is no such practice in the teaching of the Noble Ones. So where did Bhante Wimaramsi get this idea? When he was working as a Reiki energy healer in Hawaii, he no doubt encountered Morna Simona's syncretic combination of the Hawaiian religious ritual called Ho Opanopano with yogic and New Age beliefs about Kama. Her version of Ho Opanopano involved a cleansing away of bad Kama through a forgiveness practice. Later, Bhante Wumramsi would incorporate this along with other outside beliefs into his understanding of the teaching of the Noble Ones. So, what did the Blessed One teach, if not a forgiveness practice? Usually, what is meant in English by not forgiving someone is harboring thoughts of ill will, thoughts of harmfulness, thoughts of resentment, thoughts of passion with respect to that person. The Blessed One taught the Brahmaviharas, four divine abidings in which the mind is freed from ill will, freed from harmfulness, freed from resentment, freed from passion. For a mind so freed, there is no need for forgiveness. Such a mind doesn't hold any grudges, doesn't harbor ill will for any being anywhere in the world. When fully developed and pursued, such unskillful states of mind are totally eradicated. This is immeasurably more beneficial than the mere mundane forgiving piecemeal of a handful of beings. Bhante Wimaramsi clearly found that his twim version of the Brahmavihara practice doesn't free the mind from ill will, harmfulness, resentment, and passion, and so he adopted this outside forgiveness practice as an attempt to get over grudges. If he or his students were doing the genuine Brahmaviharas, they would see no need for this separate forgiveness practice. Claim Ekagata means tranquility. Ekagata. Ekagata. And, 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 but in one by one as it occurred, they don't use that word, they use unification of mind. Right. So please explain. Okay. Ekaga in Pali means tranquil. Okay. Ekagata is, it's kind of, kind of like the act of being tranquil. You feel very peaceful and collected. In Pali, the word for this state is ekagata. And if you look up the word in the Pali dictionary, ekaga means tranquility, peacefulness, and stillness of mind. It doesn't mean one-pointed or absorption, but rather, collected and unified. In this quote from his book, David Johnson is once again attempting to support a claim made by his teacher, Ante Wimlaramsi. David's argument is that the meaning of the Pali word, ikagata, should be understood through another word, ikaga. He gives the definition for this word as tranquility. It seems that David has misrepresented what the dictionary says. The prefix, ika, 
is common in Pali and simply means one or single. Literally, ikagata means gone to singleness. Ikag, single, plus gata, gone to. Ikaga has the exact same meaning because these are actually the same word. In the Pali Canon, the form ikagata and ikaga are used interchangeably, both most often paired with chitta, heart-mind, in a compound word. In English, chittas ikagata is closest in meaning to single-minded or mentally focused. Here, we have a passage illustrating how the prefix ika is used. Mendicants, I do not see a single smell that occupies a man's mind like the smell of a woman. Eka gandhampi, eka meaning single, and gandhampi meaning smell. It is clear that Bhante Wimaramsi wished to alter the definition of this word in order to make the practices that he advocated appear to match the descriptions given in the suttas, when in fact they do not. We have pointed out how the Suttavadans misrepresent the meaning of this word. However, they are not alone in doing this, and those who associate it with a mindless trance state are also misrepresenting the Dhamma. Claim Asava means distraction. It is called the Sava Sawa Sutta, and it's called all the distractions. And I changed some words around, so it's good. It says taints here, but I don't like the word taints because it doesn't have a lot of meaning to us these days. So I call it distractions. Again, Bhante Wimaramsi is changing the definition of a word in order to make it conform to his preferences and preconceptions rather than to uphold the truth. What is an asawa? There are these three. The asawa of sensuality, the asawa of becoming, and the asawa of ignorance. Asawa literally means discharge or fermentation, as in bubbling over. By extension, this refers to the discharge of an infected wound, but it also refers to intoxicating substances made from alcoholic fermentation. Common translations include effluence, taints, cankers, defilements, corruptions, and intoxicants. Here, we can see the word in its general usage in the suttas. They're like a festering sore, which, when you hit it with a stick or a stone, discharges even more. In this passage, the word asawam is used to describe what happens to a festering wound when struck with a stick or a stone. It oozes pus. This is a graphic image. Demoting taint, canker, defilement, fermentation, or intoxicant down to distraction not only obfuscates the meaning of the word, but it takes away from the seriousness and emphasis given to it by the Blessed One. These are not mere distractions. The source of these discharges is very deep, and these intoxicants are very strong. Only an arahant has totally eradicated them. Claim the Pali word Sama means harmonious or effective. I truly love the Eightfold Path, but I don't like the language of the Eightfold Path very much. When they say in Pali, they say Sama, they, it's always translated as right. But if something is right, then there's something that's wrong. That means you're looking at black and white, right? And the Eightfold Path isn't black and white. So I don't really like the word Sama in there. So, I put the English word harmonious. Now, that gives you different degrees of color that you can see with, okay? 
Now, the Eightfold Path, the way it's generally translated into English, is right view, or right understanding, right thought, right speech, <coughs> right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. I've changed all of those words because it helps with your understanding a little bit more. Samma is the word that Bhante Wimaramsi is choosing because he doesn't like it to translate as harmonious rather than right. This choice isn't completely arbitrary, but partially based on a misapprehension of the Pali language. The word Samma, meaning right, proper, righteous, correct, true, finds its opposite in the word mitsha, meaning wrong, improper, evil, incorrect, false. The word sama, meaning same or even, finds its opposite in the word wisama, meaning unalike or uneven. Pali speakers were well aware of the rhyming nature of these two words and occasionally made wordplay with them. Nevertheless, they retained their specific meanings. Sama is closely related to the English word same, meaning like, even, equal, or balanced, connoting something like in tune when used in reference to tuning a musical instrument. To explain this last part, when a musician tunes a stringed instrument by ear, he begins by tuning the first string to another instrument, and then proceeds to tune each subsequent string to the previous, so that, for example, the note A sounds the same, sama, on each string. That sama means right is clearly illustrated in the suttas. Here is just one example. Mendicants, suppose a spike of rice or barley was pointing the wrong way. If you trod on it with hand or foot, there's no way it could break the skin and produce blood. Why is that? Because the spike is pointing the wrong way. In the same way, a mendicant whose view and development of the path is pointing the wrong way cannot break ignorance produce knowledge, and realize extinguishment. Why is that? Because their view is pointing the wrong way. Suppose a spike of rice or barley was pointing the right way. If you trod on it with hand or foot, it may well break the skin and produce blood. Why is that? Because the spike is pointing the right way. In the same way, a mendicant whose view and development of the path is pointing the right way, may well break ignorance, produce knowledge, and realize extinguishment. Why is that? Because their view is pointing the right way. Here, we have seen Sama and Mitya used to illustrate the concept of right way pointing and wrong way pointing. If Sama meant harmonious, then a different simile would have been used by the Blessed One. When the Blessed One named the elements of the Noble Eightfold Path right, he did not stumble over his words, nor did he make a mistake. Claim. Right view should be harmonious perspective. So, what I call right view is harmonious perspective. What is a harmonious perspective? Seeing that all of your thoughts, all of your feelings, all of the sensations are impersonal. That is a harmonious perspective. Right view, or Samma Vitti, was never defined by the Blessed One in the way that Bhante Wimaramsi has just done. However, he did define it many times. And what is right view? Knowledge in terms of stress. Knowledge in terms of the origination of stress. Knowledge in terms of the cessation of stress. Knowledge in terms of the way of practice leading to the cessation of stress. 
This is called right view. And what is the right view with effluence, siding with merit, resulting in acquisitions? There is what is given, what is offered, what is sacrificed. There are fruits and results of good and bad actions. There is this world and the next world. There is mother and father. There are spontaneously reborn beings. There are contemplatives and Brahmins who, faring rightly and practicing rightly, proclaim this world and the next after having directly known and realized it for themselves. This is the right view with effluence, siding with merit, resulting in acquisitions. And what is the right view that is noble, without effluence, transcendent, a factor of the path? The discernment, the faculty of discernment, the strength of discernment, analysis of qualities as a factor for awakening, the path factor of right view in one developing the noble path, whose mind is noble, whose mind is without effluence, who is fully possessed of the noble path. This is the right view that is noble, without effluence, transcendent, a factor of the path. It is not possible that a true disciple of the Blessed One, a true noble person, could reject or find fault with the Blessed One's definition of right view. Claim. Right resolve should be harmonious imaging. Right thought. I call that harmonious imaging. Now, this is not imagination. It's not makeup stuff. But we all hold images of different things about ourselves. Like you hold an image of, I'm poor. I'm always poor. I never have enough to do what I want to do. When you hold that kind of image in your mind, the universe is going to give you what you hold in your mind. And as a result, you're always going to be poor. Now, I hold an image in my mind of being prosperous, because I am. I mean, I just got through traveling all the way around the world. And I'm a monk. I don't have any money. How do I do that? That's always the question that my family asks. How do you, how do you travel so much? How come you can go to all these different places? Because somebody sends me a ticket. They like me well enough that they want me to come and spend time with them. So we're also building a meditation center. We have a large dining hall and kitchen and a library above. And we just are finishing up with our meditation hall. But if you hold an image in your mind and it's a harmonious image, I'm generous. You will be. I'm kind, you will be. I'm angry, you will be. Whatever kind of an image you hold in your mind, that's what you manifest. So when you hold a harmonious image, you have the opportunity to have whatever you're holding multiply and get bigger. The next part of the Eightfold Path. They call it right thought. I call it harmonious imaging. Now that sounds a little odd, but what kind of an image do you hold? You think of a person that you don't like for whatever reason, what kind of an image are you holding of that person? Are you in harmony with that image or are you disliking that image? A lot of times people hold negative images of money. Everybody wants more but they always tell themselves they're broke, right? As a result, the universe is very confused about what, what do you want here? You want more money? You don't want more money. <laughs> right? Bhante Wilmramsi changes right resolve, or samma sankapa, to harmonious imaging, which he goes on to describe identically to the New Age view known as the Law of Attraction. The word... Sankappa means thought, resolve, intention, purpose, plan. And what 
is right resolve. The resolve for renunciation, for freedom from ill will, for harmlessness. This is called right resolve. The way Bhante Wimaramsi has described right resolve, it seems to be like it is with everyone else who believes in the law of attraction about acquiring acquisitions. But in the teaching of the noble ones, it is the resolve for renunciation that is right. Claim. Right speech should be harmonious communication. The next part of the next fold of the Eightfold Path is called right speech, and I call that harmonious communication. Now, with harmonious communication, where does your communication start? With yourself. You criticize yourself for not being as good as you think you should be. You could criticize yourself for making a mistake, not being perfect. The more you criticize yourself, the more unwholesome those thoughts become. Bhante Wimaramsi has redefined right speech, samma vacha, as harmonious communication and related it to the way one speaks to oneself internally. And what is right speech? Abstaining from lying, from divisive speech, from abusive speech, and from idle chatter. This is called right speech. The meaning of right speech is very clear and not at all controversial, and yet Bhante Wimaramsi nevertheless perceived that revision was necessary. Claim. Right action should be harmonious movement. Now the next part of the Eightfold Path, they call it uh, right action. And I call it harmonious movement. And this has, has to do directly with how you treat your mind. You suppress things, you push things down, push things away, try to force mind to be in a particular thing, a particular action that it doesn't want to be in. So you start suppressing and you start pushing down. This is not what we call harmonious movement of mind's attention. This is unharmonious movement. What's the harmonious movement of mind's attention? Opening up and allowing whatever it is to be there. You don't have to keep your attention on it. Relax. Smile. Come back to your object of meditation. And your object of meditation can be smiling. And sending lo loving and kind thoughts to everybody around you. Now, women don't want to be looking a man in the eye when they're radiating loving kindness to them because that's misunderstood. And men don't want to be looking at a woman and radiating loving and kind thoughts to them because that can be misunderstood. But you can just radiate everybody around you without getting caught up in the drama of a relationship, necessarily. So, the harmonious movement is the gentle opening up and allowing, not forcing mind to move in a particular way, backing off, taking a look at how this all happens. And that, we get more of that in a minute. Now, the next part of the Eightfold Path is called right action. It's always defined in the suttas as not killing, not stealing, not having wrong, or ha not having, uh, wrong sexual activity. No wrong, you're, that's, that's basically what it says. But what I do is I say we're talking about harmonious movement. Now think about it. When the Buddha was talking to the first five ascetics, did he think that they killed living beings? Did he think that they stole? Did he think that they had wrong sexual activity? No, so that doesn't make sense, does it? But when you change it to harmonious movement, you don't jerk your mind around from one thing to another, trying to ignore this and control that. You have to let all of that go. You move your mind harmoniously. That's the kind of action you need to do with meditation. The Noble Eightfold Path isn't to be understood and practiced only by already accomplished ascetics. It is something beneficial to all beings. The Blessed One didn't give one kind of teaching to the five ascetics and then a different teaching to everyone else. And what is right action? Abstaining from taking life, from stealing, and from sexual misconduct. 
This is called right action. The Blessed One was very clear on this point. Right action, Samma Kama, refers to good conduct. Claim. Right livelihood should be harmonious lifestyle. The next part of the Eightfold Path is called Right Livelihood. And there's a lot of different definitions of livelihood. Don't take on slaves. Don't sell poisons. Don't sell firearms. Don't use poisons. There's uh, some misunderstanding about this, so I call this harmonious lifestyle. What kind of thing do you put in your mind? You like scary movies? You put that in, in your mind, does that help your mind to be calm and peaceful? Livelihood, ajiwa, refers specifically to what one does for their livelihood. Monks, living on alms food, have practicing the Dhamma in accordance with the Dhamma as their livelihood. Anything else they might do, such as mixing herbs, evaluating gems, casting spells, forecasting eclipses, and so on, is not appropriate, would not be conducive to making progress on the path. And what is right livelihood? There is the case where a disciple of the Noble Ones, having abandoned dishonest livelihood, keeps his life going with right livelihood. This is called right livelihood. For a layperson, any livelihood involving breaking the five precepts is wrong livelihood. Claim. Right effort should be harmonious practice. Now the next part of the Eightfold Path, they, they call it right effort. Right effort has four parts to it. Noticing when there's an unwholesome state in your mind. Letting go of that unwholesome state and relaxing. Bringing up a wholesome state, smile, your object to meditation, and staying with that wholesome state. Stay with your object to meditation and smiling. I call it harmonious practice. We have already covered previously how the six R's are not, in fact, right effort. The word for effort is weamo, which means exertion, effort, striving, this is how the Blessed One described right effort. And what is right effort? There is the case where a monk generates desire, endeavors, arouses persistence, upholds and exerts his intent for the sake of the non-arising of evil, unskillful qualities that have not yet arisen. He generates desire, endeavors, arouses persistence, upholds and exerts his intent for the sake of the abandoning of evil, unskillful qualities that have arisen. He generates desire, endeavors, arouses persistence, upholds and exerts his intent for the sake of the arising of skillful qualities that have not yet arisen. And he generates desire, endeavors, arouses persistence, upholds and exerts his intent for the maintenance, non-confusion, increase, plentitude, development, and culmination of skillful qualities that have arisen. This is called right effort. The Sutuwedans take issue with right effort, primarily because the concept of striving or exertion sounds like too much work for them. Claim. Right mindfulness should be harmonious observation. The next part of the Eightfold Path, they call it right mindfulness. I call it harmonious observation. The reason I change the name of that is because for 20 years, I practiced mindfulness practice and I didn't know what mindfulness was. I've read books where there's 40 or 50 pages describing what mindfulness is and the person that wrote it didn't know what it was. <coughs> what is mindfulness? 
it's remembering to observe how mind's attention moves from one thing to another. Simple. It's remembering to observe. A lot of people talk about mindfulness. Oh, my mindfulness is not good because I did that or did this. No, they don't understand what mindfulness is. When you start talking about observation, it starts to make a little bit more sense. Now, mindfulness, one of the functions of mindfulness is to remember. I read not too long ago, a couple years ago, in an article, somebody said, well, I want to talk about mindfulness. And they had four teachers, and they tried to describe mindfulness. And one of them said, it's to remember, to remember, to remember, to remember. <laughs> okay. To remember what? <coughs> what are you talking about? At the end of the article, the guy that uh, was uh, interviewing these four teachers wrote, well, I guess we'll find out what mindfulness is at some time later, because none of them had a clue. Isn't that sad? It's remembering to observe how mind's attention moves. Bhante Wilmaramsi's definition of mindfulness is too limited. It applies, if at all, only to one of the four foundations of mindfulness. Mindfulness of mind. The word sati means memory or mindfulness. It is true that very few people teaching today understand mindfulness. What Bhante Wilmaramsi didn't realize was that he himself was included in that category. Mindfulness is not only about paying attention. It's about retaining and recalling the teaching. It's about knowing what you're doing when you're doing it. It's about exercising self-control. The person who delights in food as Bhante Wilmaramsi delighted in his sweets and cigarettes, is not being mindful at that time, no matter how closely they are paying attention to the enjoyment of that food. Why is that? Because they have forgotten that such delighting goes against the teaching of the Noble Ones, or there has been a lapse of their mindfulness to the extent that they are unaware of what they are doing as they are doing it only becoming aware after the mistake has already been made and the consequences of that action are certain to follow. Because the Sutuadans take this limited view of mindfulness, they are incapable of practicing mindfulness of the body, incapable of practicing mindfulness of feelings, incapable of practicing mindfulness of the mind, incapable of practicing mindfulness of mental qualities. If the attention has moved away from the object of meditation, then the mindfulness has fallen away. At that time, there is no mindfulness. But this is the state that the Sutuadans cultivate. The six R's cause the attrition of mindfulness. The description that the Blessed One gave of mindfulness is quite clear and detailed, but one needs to have the humility to actually listen to his words. And what is right mindfulness? There is the case where a monk remains focused on the body in and of itself, ardent, alert, and mindful, putting aside greed and distress with reference to the world. He remains focused on feelings in and of themselves, ardent, alert, and mindful, putting aside greed and distress with reference to the world. He remains focused on the mind, in and of itself, ardent, alert, and mindful, putting aside greed and distress with reference to the world. He remains focused on mental qualities, in and of themselves, ardent, alert, and mindful, putting aside greed and distress with reference to the world. This is called right mindfulness. Claim. Right concentration should be harmonious collectedness. Now the last part of the Eightfold Path is really kind of tricky because they call it right concentration. And concentration, although it's a correct word, it's a misunderstood word. There's a kind of concentration that's called one-pointed concentration or absorption concentration or ecstatic meditation where you're taking your mindfulness of breathing 
and you're focusing only on the breath, right here, and you just focus on that, to the exclusion of everything else around you. And eventually what happens is you'll have a sign arise. A sign in this kind of meditation is like a white disc that comes up in your mind. Okay, the Buddha didn't really talk about that. That's talked about in the commentaries, but it's not talked about in the suttas. So I changed the word from concentration to collectedness. Why did I pick that word? When you look it up in a dictionary, it gives you three or four different de definitions. A composed mind and alert mind. A mind that's very still. A serene mind. So it's real interesting because in uh, the dictionary that Rice Davids uh, wrote, he, was, he has a long section on samadhi. That's the Pali word for this. And in that explanation of what he thought samadhi is, he mentioned that before the time of the Buddha, samadhi was not a word that was used. The Buddha made this word up to describe a particular kind of mental state. And a couple hundred years after the Buddha died, there was a whole bunch of Brahmins that took on robes, but they were teaching anything but Buddhism. And they started changing definitions around. And they started calling it concentration because that's the kind of meditation that they did, one-pointed concentration. And it's kind of stuck. Samadhi is a difficult word to translate. Bhante Wimaramsi took issue with concentration as a translation because this word has long been associated with so-called one-pointed yogic trance practices, practices that he himself had undertaken and seen to be of little value. This much is true. Bhante Wimaramsi's choice of collectedness is not the worst but leaves out something that concentration captures, and that is goal-directedness. Samadhi has a purpose. It refers to the gathering of awareness around a theme. It is not an ordinary state. The Blessed One pointed out that there is wrong samadhi as well as right samadhi. In a person of wrong view, wrong resolve comes into being in a person of wrong resolve, wrong speech. In a person of wrong speech, wrong action. In a person of wrong action, wrong livelihood. In a person of wrong livelihood, wrong effort. In a person of wrong effort, wrong mindfulness. In a person of wrong mindfulness, wrong concentration. In a person of wrong concentration, wrong knowledge. In a person of wrong knowledge, wrong release. This is how, from wrongness, comes failure, not success. The Blessed One said, In any doctrine and discipline where the noble eightfold path is not ascertained, no contemplative of the first, second, third, fourth order, stream winner, once returner, non returner, or arahant, is ascertained. But, in any doctrine and discipline where the noble eightfold path is ascertained, contemplatives of the first, second, third, fourth order are ascertained. The noble eightfold path is ascertained in this doctrine and discipline, and right here there are contemplatives of the first, second, third, fourth order. Other teachings are empty of knowledgeable contemplatives. And if the monks dwell rightly, this world will not be empty of arahants. We have seen that the Sutuvedans have left no factor of the Noble Eightfold Path unaltered in their teaching. As a result of this, they have created something else entirely, an ignoble Eightfold Path. But this is only one of many, because this practice of altering the teaching has been going on for a very long time. One can take these ignoble eightfold paths as far as they go and reach something that one conceives as liberation, but nevertheless still be bound up even more tightly with greed, hatred, and delusion. Claim. The Brahma Viharas and the Jhanas are the same practice. The feeling of loving kindness moving upwards across the chest towards your head. Do not stop it. 
allow it to go where it wants. You begin to notice that you are losing some feeling in your body in the areas of your hands, arms, or legs, like you are beginning to disappear. You experience feeling lighter in your head, like the head is feeling full, or it seems like things are moving away from you when you close your eyes. The texture of loving kindness changes to a softer feeling, like a cotton ball when it moves up into the head. This just means compassion is waking up. Next, this expansion contracts back in and the feeling in mind changes to empathetic joy. Some might feel something at a different sense base, like a tiny tapping on the cheek or a tone repeating in the ear, and then changes into a quiet balance of mind. Only a stable and balanced feeling. Now, you can use this equanimity. The Sutawaitans have made many claims regarding the Brahmaviharas and the Janas and their relationship. In their materials and discourses, they emphasize that the Brahmaviharas are meant to develop, progress, and transform automatically. They say things like, the loving kindness moves into the head and changes into compassion, or that the Brahmaviharas are a feeling meditation which have no basis in the suttas. When asked from where these views originate, they refuse to answer or evade the question. This view that the Brahmaviharas and the Jhanas are the same practice comes from a single discourse in the Pali Canon. This being the Metta Sutta, Samyutta Nikaya 46.54. In this sutta, the Brahmaviharas are described as culminating in the following attainments. Goodwill has the beautiful as its excellence. Compassion has the dimension of infinite space as its excellence. Sympathetic joy has the dimension of infinite consciousness as its excellence. Equanimity has the dimension of nothingness as its excellence. There is no reference to jhana in this sutta. Somehow, Bhante Wimaramsi concluded, after having read this sutta, that the jhanas and the Brahmaviharas were meant to always be practiced at the same time, and that the majority of references to the jhanas in the suttas were really referring to this combined practice. There is one sutta that describes the combining of the Brahmaviharas and the jhanas, the Sankita Sutta and Guttara Nikaya 8.70. But in this sutta, the combination is done in a completely different way than what the Suttavadins teach. The vast majority of descriptions of the Brahmaviharas have nothing to do with jhana, and the vast majority of the descriptions of jhana have nothing to do with the Brahmaviharas. These were taught as separate practices. No honest reading of the suttas could conclude otherwise. They're described using different terms. Jhana is strongly associated with samadhi. The definition given for right samadhi is the four jhanas, and samadhi is mentioned in the jhana descriptions. The Brahmaviharas are not described as being involved in samadhi, except in one sutta, the Sankita Sutta mentioned earlier. The Brahmaviharas are described as liberations of awareness or Cheta Vimuti. The word Brahmavihara means divine abiding. Both the Brahmaviharas and the Jhanas are described as Viharati, abidings, and as Bhavana or developments. The instructions for the Brahmaviharas make no reference to samadhi or to mindfulness or to unification or any of the other jhana factors. But the Suttavadins blend this all together in a way that is found nowhere in the discourses of the Blessed One. They talk of the transition from one Brahmavihara to the next as being an automatic process but we see no reference to this in the suttas. There is, however, a process of development 
described by the Blessed One. It goes like this. When he sees that they, the five hindrances, have been abandoned within him, gladness is born. In one who is gladdened, rapture is born. Enraptured at heart, his body grows tranquil. With his body tranquil, he is sensitive to pleasure. Feeling pleasure, his mind enters samadhi. This is the process that occurs leading to the establishing of the first jhana. The suttas speak of mastery, of excellence, of discernment with regard to jhana. But the suttavadins reject mastery, excellence, and discernment, preferring to rely on this automatic response they elicit, and rushing ahead to the finish line without paying attention to where they have come from or what direction they're headed in. The genuine Brahma-viharas free the mind from ill will, harmfulness, resentment, and passion. But we have seen that the Suttavadins are not freed from these unskillful states. They resent those who ask them reasonable questions. They knowingly give harmful instructions to students, and so on. The genuine jhanas brighten the mind, heighten the mind, sharpen the mind. But we have seen that the Suttavadins are dim of mind, low of mind, dull of mind. Whether or not the Brahmaviharas and the jhanas can be combined into one practice is not the question that should be asked here. The question that should be asked is why have they deviated to such a great extent from the instructions that the Blessed One has given? Why do they say that his preferred practice, the practice he taught most often, the practice he taught his own son, namely, mindfulness of in and out breathing, or the development of the four great elements, is next to worthless compared to what they teach. We haven't seen any evidence that the Sutuadans are actually entering any jhana or any Brahmavihara, and much evidence to the contrary. But they are certainly experiencing some phenomena which they are mislabeling as the Brahmavihara attitudes or the jhana factors. If one doesn't understand the Brahmaviharas and doesn't understand the jhanas, then how is it reasonable to expect that combining those two incorrect practices would result in a correct practice? Claim. Twim teaches from the suttas. What I'm doing is teaching what the suttas say. And we're calling it Tranquil Wisdom Insight Meditation, TWIM. Mm -hmm. TWIM, okay. Definitely a commentary. What is a commentary? A commentary is something that is an opinion about what the Buddha was talking about. When I give a discourse, I, I am giving you some opinion, but the opinions I'm giving you match up with what it says in the suttas. As I use the suttas as my guide, it really tells me everything that I've told you. The practice of TWIM is new in the sense it has been rediscovered in the suttas. It is not practiced very widely yet, which seems rather surprising. In fact, Venerable Bhante Vimalaramsi and his approved teachers are the only ones who teach directly from the suttas in this way. Others reference the suttas, but don't follow them precisely. TWIM is the actual and correct application of right effort. I started doing that with some suttas, starting adding some this sutta to that sutta because it just kind of worked really nice. <coughs> one, of, one of the suttas that I really like is the Sunyata Sutta. But in the Sunyata Sutta, it starts talking about meditation with a casina. And I know what casinas are, and I know I have practiced casina meditation, but it was absorption concentration. And I've never run across anybody that actually told me how to do it. <coughs> so I've taken that part out, and I put the Brahma Viharas in it. 
and it works great. The Sutta Vedans do indeed read from the suttas. When the twin materials do include references to the suttas, which is rarely, it is usually the case that the sutta referenced has nothing to do with the claim being attached to it. Some of this distortion comes from the way they pervasively change the definitions of words. But Bhante Wilmaramsi has also admitted to taking passages from one sutta and inserting them into another in order to make the text appear to conform to his preconceptions. 2,600 years ago, the Blessed One foresaw this eventuality. Monks, there once was a time when the Dasarahas had a large drum called Summoner. Whenever Summoner was split, the Dasarahas inserted another peg in it. Until the time came when Summoner's original wooden body had disappeared and only a conglomeration of pegs remained. In the same way, in the course of the future, there will be monks who won't listen when discourses that are the words of the Tathagata, deep, deep in their meaning, transcendent, connected with emptiness, are being recited. They won't lend ear, won't set their hearts on knowing them, won't regard these teachings as worth grasping, or mastering. But they will listen when discourses that are literary works, the works of poets, elegant in sound, elegant in rhetoric, the work of outsiders, words of disciples, are being recited. They will lend ear and set their hearts on knowing them. They will regard these teachings as worth grasping and mastering. In this way, the disappearance of the discourses that are words of the Tathagata, deep, deep in their meaning, transcendent, connected with emptiness, will come about. Monks, these two slander the Tathagata. Which two? He who explains what was not said or spoken by the Tathagata, as said or spoken by the Tathagata, and he who explains what was said or spoken by the Tathagata as not said or spoken by the Tathagata. These are the two who slander the Tathagata. Bhante Wimaramsi and his disciples claim to teach from the suttas, and yet, as we have seen, upon examination, the great majority of what they said can be found nowhere in the suttas. It is like those pegs patching up a drum. If one keeps patching in this way, eventually nothing will remain of the original substance. David Johnson was half right when he wrote in his book that no one today is teaching from the suttas. The fact is that there is no sect extant today which practices the Dhamma in accordance with the Dhamma, and this includes the Suttawedan sect. So why do this? Why read from the suttas at all if what is being read is going to be altered until it's almost unrecognizable? It's an old magician's trick, an old sleight of hand. By saying that they teach from the suttas, the Suttawedans gain an air of legitimacy. They can hold up the suttas like a magician might hold up an intact spoon, waving it around and saying, See, this is intact, this is good. Then, they show you something else in their other hand, a dented spoon, and hope that you don't notice that there were always two spoons, not one, and the whole trick was prepared in advance. And if anyone were to notice, then they know how to make that troublesome person disappear. There is no path from the teaching of the Noble Ones to the teaching of the Suttawedans, just as the magician does not actually dent the spoon by pressing it with his thumb. It is merely a trick, an illusion, a deception, intended to enthrall and ensnare the onlooker. It is, 
In short, nothing but a con. The discourses of the Blessed One are here, waiting to be read, waiting to be remembered, waiting to be taken to heart and practiced. Only those who follow the genuine, noble Eightfold Path can receive the fruit and reward of that noble Eightfold Path. There is no other way than this. Suffering. 